Good morning and welcome to day two of our symposium on plant biodiversity and traditional medicine, then, now and the future. I am Roxanne Wade and I will be your host for the event. On day one of our symposium, we took a journey into the past and we examined how local plants were used in colonial times. We discussed how local plants can be used to promote health and wellness in these times when non-communicable diseases are prevalent. We were also encouraged to start thinking about the need to preserve some of the local traditions and preparations of Caribbean plants for future generations. Our first session today is all about young people and their perspectives on having a pharmacy right in your home garden. We want the session to be as interactive as possible. They've already started the dialogue and started to get highfalutin with their science. So I can't wait to hear what they bring to the table today. We are encouraging you to put your comments in the chat and your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom screen. For those on Facebook, I think there's a medium for you to put your comments or your questions there as well. The Youth Dialogue today will be led by Ms. Marsha Ann Clark, Executive Founder and CEO of Youth Equipped to Achieve. It promises to be a very lively and stimulating discussion. Ms. Clark is an International Youth Development Specialist. She has delivered training workshops, addressed audiences, and engaged youth and youth development professionals throughout the Caribbean and in the USA. She gained a bachelor's degree from UWI and an MBA from the University of South Florida, specializing in the areas of entrepreneurship, international business, marketing, and management. Ms. Clark founded Ye in 2003 in Florida, and the charity, charity is registered sorry, in Barbados and in Dominica. She will be supported by two members of our partnership today, Dr. David Bino and Dr. Damien Kohal. Ms. Clark, the floor and is all yours. You and your team, we're excited to hear what you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roxanne, for that introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Bino and the team at the Jeff Small Grants Program for providing this platform where youth can have a voice. Our youth are old enough to vote, so they're definitely old enough to have a voice and an input into medicine in Barbados and across the world. Now, a lot of times we hear about um, sexism, we hear about racism, but people don't talk about ageism. So I think it's really important that we have a platform provided where there is no discrimination just because we have young people. I'm going to invite Jade, Shawnee, and Robali, or youth panelists, to turn on their cameras, turn on their mics so that we can see you. I'm going to frame this morning's session, and then I will ask them to introduce themselves, and we will jump right in. So here's the frame, first of all. So here you are, a Caribbean person, Trinidad, Barbados, Jamaica, wherever. You have an ailment. You go and you see a Caribbean doctor. That Caribbean doctor writes you a prescription that you take to a Caribbean pharmacy and a Caribbean pharmacist fills that prescription and hands you some medicine from somewhere outside of the Caribbean, maybe North America, maybe Europe. Now I frame that against the backdrop that yesterday our supporting panelists, Dr. Bino, Dr. Kohal, they shared some statistics and they said somewhere between 80 and 90% of the world use medicine that is not what is called, uh, let's see, orthodox medicine or conventional medicine. So that's the framing. I looked up the definitions. Oxford Languages says, when you talk about conventional, on a personal level, it says concern with what is generally held to be acceptable at the expense of individuality or sincerity. Another definition is based on or in accordance with what is generally done or believed. So part of the framework for this morning, and we're gonna talk about many different things, is the term conventional or traditional medicine. And if more than 80% of the world is using what we call traditional based on those definitions, how did we get there? And as the future, where are we going? 
So now I'm going to invite you, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce yourselves, and we'll jump right into Youth Dialogue. We'll start with Shawnee. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Shawnee and I study psychology at the University of the West Indies. And as Marsha would have said today, I am with my colleagues Jade and Rabali, and we're just going to tell you a little bit about medicine in our gardens and realistically what it has to do with our respective disciplines. You know, we have Rabali doing computer science and Jade doing biology and psychology. So I'll let them tell them a little bit more about themselves. So next we'll have Jade. Thank you, Shawnee. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jade Hunt. I am 19 years old. I am a student of the University of the West Indies studying biology and psychology. As Shania would have said just now this morning, we'll be talking about medicine in our gardens and as the youth, what is our perspective on that? Thank you, Jade. And next we have Robali. Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Robali Suet, and I am a second year computer science major at the University of the West Indies. Now, you may wonder what is a computer science major doing on a panel talking about plant biodiversity and medicine? Well, you can find out in a short time. All right, excellent. Thank you for those introductions. Let us jump right in. Tell us your thoughts on the medicine that is available. And more importantly, I think, Shawnee, we would have done a survey on our volunteer internship um, program chat. And I think you have some results that you can share with our audience. Yeah, so as Marsha would have said earlier, we were really thinking about how, um, as I said yesterday, 80% of the world is not really tapping into this traditional medicine. So in our results, we saw that we asked if the volunteers would use any natural products and 84.8% said yes, while 15.2% said no. We also asked if they preferred the use of the natural medicines or pharmacological medicines and 57.6% said that they prefer both. 36.4% said they prefer to use natural remedies and 6.1% said they preferred pharmacological remedies. And then we also asked if when they were ill, which one would they try first? And 63.6 .6 said pharmacological remedies, while well, only 36% said natural. And we also asked if they use any plant medicine at all when they're feeling ill. And the 69.7, sorry, said yes, while well, 30 said no. And then we asked if they prefer to actually use the natural or pharmacological, and we saw that 57.6 said both, 18.2 said pharmacological, and 24.2 said natural. So with that, we see really the, the difference in people that, like what people prefer to use versus what they actually use, probably because of the way that they were raised, probably because, you know, some people might tend to use more natural things because they may be um, raised by their grandparents whereas more modern people would tend to probably gravitate toward using more pharmacological methods because you know that is what is really present in the lives of those people at the moment okay thanks for that shawnee jada Romali, any comments or anything you wish to add to that what were your thoughts on the results of the survey um, i just yes, thought it was interesting to see how in this generation you really you get a glimpse of you know the new age with the western medicine but also being able to see as shana would have said that how people were raised if they were raised by their grandparents who would have raised them up you know to use the traditional medicine like what what is their preference what is their go-to when push comes to shove yes yeah, so it you. also shows like, you know, persons may prefer to use the pharmaceutical drugs because, you know, they have, like, evidence that says, okay, this works now, this works when, as opposed to the natural medicine. Personally, I prefer natural medicine and stuff because I grew up with my grandmother for part of time. And, you know, every time something would, um, especially if I had the cold and start coughing, it would be some shirshi bush, right? Or anything more so natural and like for headaches i tend not to take any panadol or like paracetamol maybe but just try to rest them off myself or look at some natural way to alleviate it 
Yeah, so okay. I think that is very interesting how Rabali shared his experience because one of the open-ended questions we actually asked the volunteers in the survey is after like telling us what they use, what they prefer, why do they actually prefer this? And then we see a lot of the um, responses just showing the um, like how much the, the volunteers would have known about traditional medicine versus more contemporary and pharmacological methods. And a lot of them said, like, this is how they were raised. But then they also said things like um, the natural medicines would maybe work a little less fast than pharmacological medicines. One example that was given is if they're feeling a little sick, they may take a vitamin C tablet, like maybe the effervescent ones. And that would probably make you feel a little bit more energized quicker than if you were to um, eat a whole set of citrus fruits, maybe oranges, etc. So the response time of the medicine is also um, something that the, the response is considered when talking about if um, they prefer it because it was because they, they were raised on it or if it's because this is realistically all that they know. Interesting. Um, interesting. Could I could I ask a question? If, if I'm yeah, I, absolutely. I was just going to say we have a pharmacologist here with us. So as yes. far as dose response and how quickly um, things get absorbed into the body, my mind wondered, you know, is that true? If I eat an orange, will that be absorbed less quickly than an effervescent tablet? And what else is in that? What makes it effervescent? You know, so talk yeah. to us, Dr. Gohal. Well, um, so so let me start with your question first, um, Marsha. So so yes, um, in pharmacology, uh, we speak a lot about dose response, right? So for a given dose, there's an expected response, and this generally, uh, you know, uh, increments as the dose. Um, the response generally increments as the dose increases until there is what we call a, a maximal response um, to that given drug. Um, the other thing that we have to consider, as I lighted, is formulation factors, right? So based on the formulation of drugs and substances, there could be different rates of absorption, right? Um, uh, so persons who take herbal remedies in syrups, etc., cetera, um, the sugars in the syrup will actually facilitate fast absorption, right? Because our guts, right, are designed to absorb glucose and sugars, right? Um, so that facilitates the absorption um, process in the small intestine and also in the stomach. Um, so, so, so very important points, um, Marsha, and, and thanks for those two questions. The, 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 the question I wanted to ask was in relation to the survey, and I, I just was quite curious about the, the setting of the survey, if it was uh, a more urbanized area versus rural area. Um, because I wanted to just pick up on, um, you know, the study that I mentioned yesterday about rurality and, and the richness of the information within rural districts compared to urbanized districts, and, and right. also some of the factors which may impact um, high usage rates in rural areas compared to urbanized areas. So my first okay. question was really about the, the actual setting of the um, so survey. Right. So I, I will jump in and, and give her a disclaimer. You know, our students haven't done a robust scientific um, research on this. Essentially, it was thrown out to um, the members of our chat just to get a quick feedback, okay. um, you know, knowing that we're coming into a chat and as they're representing other youth, we then just want to have their voices. Okay, perfect. So, um, yeah. Going forward, I think certainly we can look at doing um, some more robust research because what we're saying to the youth is, you know, and I'm sure um, Dr. Bynum will talk about this later, probably tell us more about how much money we're spending um, in Barbados, and I don't know if we have information for the region, on importing pharmaceuticals. So the young people having the buying power for tomorrow and being the ones, because we're looking at then, now, in the future, they're going to have to make a determination, have a voice, and perhaps influence any policy changes as to whether when you go to the pharmacy, you know, do we want a Barbados a couple years down the line where your pharmacist can prescribe a pinch of this or a slice of alas or, you know, the things that if, and I see some big smiles. Uh, one of the things we threw out when we had our informal dialogue was if COVID shut the place down, there are no more medicines, conventional medicines coming into Barbados where are you going to go? R Robali, you want to tell us what your immediate reaction was? <laughs> the immediate reaction was to that question? Uh, the reaction to that question. 
yeah, where are you going? You have to turn back to the garden. You have to turn back to where it originally started, where it came from, right? So that's what I was thinking will happen if everything was shut down. Yeah. Excellent. Jade, Shawnee, jump right in. I, I saw your smiles and your nods. <laughs> yeah. Um, we were yeah. really talking about we have to turn right back to what, what we traditionally knew. My immediate question probably for Dr. Damien was one of the responses was that they're worried about the safety of the natural product. And my immediate thought was maybe if we knew more and if we were more educated mm -hmm. on the natural products, then it wouldn't be such a big safety concern. But um, Dr. Damien could probably answer, how much safer is it to use the natural products as compared to the pharmacological products? We're warming things up now. Yes, and a, and a very important question. Uh, you know, I, I touched on this um, in my presentation yesterday, just slightly. But I, but I mentioned that persons, there's a growing distrust among what we consider conventional or orthodox medicine. And it is because of the transition in approaches. Um, so 3000 BC or 5000 years ago, when, you know, we started to investigate the use of um, plants and other natural sources for medicine, um, medicines were taken in their natural forms. But as we have grown and developed into industrialized states and developed pharmaceutical industries, we have now shifted towards synthetics. Now, synthetic drugs, um, unfortunately, uh, they are what we consider to be more potent. And, and some of you might be wondering what is potency, but potency speaks about the, the affinity of a drug molecule binding to its respective target, right? So synthetic drugs are definitely more potent and, and people who are into drug development will tell you that, oh, we look for the potent drugs, right? Because those are the ones that will essentially bring about a response upon bi binding to their respective targets biologically. But uh, a molecule that is more potent will also be known to have associated with it more adverse effects, right? Because drugs don't only bind to a target in one given location of the body, they will bind to that same target that is in a duplicity or a multiplicity of various locations within the body. And that is how we get adverse effects and side effects. So, 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 so there you have it. One of the major reasons why people have been, you know, growing away from using synthetic products to more natural based medicines for preventative and even for also for curative medicine. Uh, but the, to, to answer your question in a more general way, we still have to be careful about the use of plant material because the same synthetic um, compounds that are developed into active pharmaceutical ingredients um, they may have a similar type of reactions um, with, you know, natural products, um, being that they could actually interact when taken together, right? And uh, they could also bind to the same targets, and that itself can bring about a very interesting um, phenomena within pharmacology called drug interactions, right? Um, where you have two different substances, you take in the herb to lower your blood pressure, but you're also taking a conventional drug to lower your blood pressure. And both of them are binding at the same target or at separate targets, but together they bring about a synergistic effect, which brings the blood pressure too low, and then you develop another problem, right? Um, however, I must add that drug interactions also do have beneficial effects and some persons with ailments may need more than one drug and take two conventional drugs to bring about that particular therapeutic effect. So we have to know a little bit more about drug interactions uh, to be able to say if they are safe, right, or if they are problematic. And uh, with that knowledge, right, then we can speak a lot more about the usefulness of herbs herbs used complementary to conventional medicine and herbs used as alternative uh, to conventional medicine. Okay, so let me let me jump in and stir things up just a little, little bit more. Um, and, and thank you for answering in that way. I'll, I'll give the disclaimer. Um, we're students, the dialogue that we're having, I'm not a medical professional, so we're not giving medical advice, but we're having a dialogue, which is a two-way. What I heard just now, and, and young people certainly jump into if you will, what I heard just now is that the synthetic drugs, similar to the plant drugs, can interact. So right. either of them can have the same, same effect. 
And where I'm going is, you know, we, we often hear you have to be careful in terms of using the natural medicines because we don't know how they will interact with the so-called conventional medicine. What about if we flip that? So if you're going to your doctor and the doctor is prescribing this medicine that I don't know how much information we have about, I think certainly yourself and others, um, other pra you know, practitioners and others in particular fields, you know, they have access to the research. They know what is in a set of medicine and what, what are in all these things, but we don't necessarily. So you go to a doctor and this is prescribed and you're using it. Um, but then if you're using some of this Cersei bush or this soursop leaves and other things, a doctor saying, well, you have to be careful using the natural stuff because it may bring your blood pressure too low. What about if we flip it and we're using the natural stuff and if, from what you said, the synthetic drugs tend to be more potent, which could also mean more quickly harmful. If I use the leaves and they're going to bring my blood pressure down gradually, this is just my simple mind thinking, mm -hmm. might it not be better for me to use the natural stuff, see the effect that it is having, and then working with my doctor? The doctor says, well, you have to be careful using this prescription because then that can bring it down too low. And maybe the doctor lowers the synthetic while we increase the natural. Just a thought, young people, have your say. Um, well, when I would have been reading up to prepare for today, I remember seeing something about how practitioners of the herbal the natural medicine believe that an active ingredient can lose its impact or become less safe if used in isolation from the rest of the plant. So I think the example that was used was salicylic acid, which is found in the plant meadow sweet, if I'm correct, and is to be used um, as aspirin, but aspirin can cause the lining of the stomach to bleed, but the meadow sweet, meadow sweet naturally contains other compounds that prevent irritation from the salicylic acid. Yeah. That, interesting, that, very interesting information. <laughs> Very much so. Um, interesting observation. Um, you know, even during my training uh, as a pharmacologist, we were always, you know, um, taught that, you know, we should look for that one single compound in the plant that brings about the effect. And, and that is basically the same type of um, theoretical approach and practical approach that has been used in the pharmaceutical industry. Because even drugs that were derived from plants it was through chemical expiration of one compound in that plant that brought about that effect. Now, what that one compound allows you to do within that conventional setting, of course, is to be able to standardize that effect. And you know, we started the, um, the dialogue speaking about dose response relationships, which is a very important um, aspect of what we do in pharmacology. Uh, however, we're now seeing uh, more reports of entourage effects. And what do I mean by entourage effect? Where we see where a multiple of compounds working together bring about a more balanced effect, right? To bring about wellness and health. And, and of course, this is of course more observed among um, plants which are used primarily for preventive uh, medicine as opposed to curative medicine, right? Um, cannabis being a very popular plant because it's controlled, but we also know that it's medicinal um, they speak not only about the health effects of the cannabinoids, but also the terpenoids and the other important phytochemicals that are part of that compound, right? And, and the last point I want to raise about which, which Marsha alluded to in her presentation about why, why not start with herbal and then, you know, titrate, you know, the, the actual conventional, you know, or more westernized approach. It is also because of how we have been um, culturized or, or, or lack of a better word, deculturized, mm -hmm. where we have moved away from these traditional approaches because we thought that the Western approaches were better. So within conventional medicine, when you go to your physician, your physician is trained uh, from a very, with a very Westernized approach where it is taught that pharmaceutical products are better standardized, have gone through controlled trials right? And uh, we can speak to their safety and efficacy while natural products uh, are not, right? Are quite the opposite. 
but I would just like to say this, and this itself might spark some other interesting um, comments, that our traditional approaches are indeed scientific, right? Uh, they may not have been uh, inferred from what we now call randomized control trials, but these were countless of trials over many years. Um, in Dr. Peter's presentation yesterday where she spoke about slavery, uh, we know that some of these approaches were used within that time and outside of that time, all the way going back to 3000 BC. Father Clark, when he spoke yesterday, he said that there is also evidence that it could have been before 3000 BC that plants were used as medicines. So, you know, the, it, it, it has to do with how we have been um, educated, unfortunately, um, moving us away from our traditional approaches to think that the westernized approach because it's more controlled, that it's better. But we have a vast amount of evidence to point to our plants being safe and, and, and efficacious. You know, our foreparents, they were able to determine if plants were safe by just observing how animals, right, and other individuals interacted with these plants, right? And they were draw their, infer their scientific inference based on a repetitive observation of people interacting and using these plants. To speak about Wait, which, which is a definition which is a definition of okay, scientific yeah. yeah if yes, i can come yes. in here go ahead, Dr. Um, and, and then i'm going to go to some comments that are in the chat because we have a, a lively chat going as well but please go ahead david excellent what is being said by um um Shani and also by dr Kohol dr. is very important because when when we discuss the whole issue of how people value these medicinal plants who will use them first who would see them as a go-to, um, you know, if it's going to be a primary source or secondary source, they're going to use it collectively, if they're not going to use it at all. These things, when you study it um, from a value perspective or willingness to pay perspective, which is the economic lens, these things are highly influenced by socio-economic um, factors. So it means that these things could actually change. These perceptions can change. You find that as a person increased in education, because of the educational system that we do have, they tend to use less um, traditional medicine. You also find as a person increased in income, they may also use less traditional medicine. You find that those people who have lowered that disposable income go to these traditional medicines because they can easily access them and they are low cost. So we need to understand these socio um, economic and sometimes even social demographic because age plays an important factor. Older people may go towards more traditional medicines. And therefore, the work that Dr. Dr. Kohol is doing, Dr. Peter and others within our region, that's very important. But we need then to translate that information to change the system. Because if we realize that education is actually moving people away, it should not be that way. Because we, we as we increase in education, we should understand as the team today for World Health Day is, you know, our planet, our health. So there's a direct connection between biodiversity and specific plant biodiversity and our health. And if we are moving away from that connection, then we have to question the quality of our education. And I'll leave it at that. You, you make a really good point. And what I want to, to build on there is the question to our young people, when you think of furthering your education, so you have your education at the University of the West Indies, but when you're thinking about your master's, typically where are you encouraged to think of? Is it in China? Is it in Israel? Is it in the other parts of the world that use the medicines that are like ours? And I, I'm trying to shy away from the term like traditional, uh, David and Damien know why, and look at maybe calling it Western or European versus Eastern or you know our cultural medicine, because I really want to hammer home the point that one is not necessarily better than the other. If I go back to the original statistics, if 80 to 90% of the world is using one type of medicine and only 20%, you know, roughly 10 to 20%, just because of the math, are using the medicines that we have access to, why is that? How did we get there? And how do we turn it around? Maybe part of that is because we tend to, and I did my master's in the US, so, if our people are being educated in North America and in Europe, and then we're being sold the medication that's also coming from those places, maybe not so much that we have to question our own education here or education system here, 
but we have to look at the mindset that's being given to us. I know I was told you go to school and you learn well and you get a good job so that you don't have to go and work in the fields. And I understand, you know, the background with which that would have been said by your parents, your grandparents. But now I feel like I'm finding the keys to a happy, healthy life because of the amount of time that I spend in the garden, which is why Jade, Robali, the other young people have been coming, literally getting their hands dirty and understanding the psychological as well as the medicinal value, the medicine that's in our gardens. So I see- friend, um, one, one, one final point on that quickly. That engagement that you're providing with these um, students and these young people are also part of the same socioeconomic factors because as you have a great affinity or engagement with nature, you tend to value the provisions of nature much more. So then those Absolutely. persons who engage with nature are more likely to utilize traditional medicine. So all these factors are very important. They need to be well understood, but it then needs to be translated into policy because it means that we can change these perceptions. Yes, absolutely. I want to take a moment to go to some of the comments that we have. Um, there are quite a few now. So we have Jessica who said, I definitely hear about the natural remedies being safer in quotations and pharmaceuticals, much less side effects. Um, we have Jaranga who's saying, I feel the young lady's contribution has validity, more, supp more supplements and medications advise that they should be taken with food. Uh, we have Gilbertha who is thanking us for the discussion and it, encouraging the use of uh, traditional herbal medicines. We have, you know, we're thanking for a lot of the research and more. Someone is saying, my parents swear by eating or consuming the vitamin, minerals, et cetera, in plants um, or meat because it's more affordable. We also have a comment from Andrea to piggyback on Dr. Kohal's point on cultural factors. Western medicine is also very much driven by commerce and capitalism. We also have to be mindful of the underlying factors behind conventional healthcare solutions. We need to ensure that we're doing what is best for our region, both health-wise and from an economic perspective. Excellent. So thank you. Thank you for your comments and any questions that you have, please go ahead and put in the chat or in the Q&A. And I'll go back to our, our youth participants, Jade Rubali Shane. Um, we had some interesting dialogue on technology. Um, Rubali opened by saying, what does a computer science major have? You know, what is his role and how come he is here in a symposium talking about plant biodiversity and traditional medicine? And Robali did um, a project recently at the UWA, and I'm going to let him share a little bit about that project and then perhaps invite Dr. Kohal to say one or two things about how the science and the plant medicine can work with the computer science. Robali? Yes, please. So I'm um, about say four or five weeks ago i had to do a presentation on virtual plants and its relation with computational biology now virtual plant is a 3d model of an actual real life plant that you will use with a computer and what you will do you will get the respective sorry respectable programming language and you will then input real world variables and then try to simulate how this plant would grow um, the goal was to be able to grow a plant from a seed virtually into its fully grown state. However, this has not been met as yet because there are just too many real world variables that cannot be exactly put into a program as yet. Because normally a program you would say is quote unquote static world, the real world is dynamic. There's just too many changing things. However, if this can be perfected, probably with the use of an intelligent AI, right? whenever we do get to that point, this could potentially save a lot on important costs, especially here in Barbados, because let's say you want um, strawberries. I know that they can grow in Barbados, but they do not grow the best. With virtual plants using simulations, you could then put in some like say tweaks to the simulation on the computer and use Barbados's geographical information. Right. And then after you do that, you can then adjust the suit to see how then these plants could grow in Barbados properly. And then when you get that figured out, it literally will save some important costs, which should then give us tremendous economic benefit. 
And then, you know, it would be nice to know that you wouldn't have to go somewhere else or have to rely on overseas. They could just grow it here and enjoy the benefits. Excellent. Thank you for that, Robali. And I, I promised our students, they already know me and how I like to laugh a little bit. Part of what I want to break down, flowing from what David was saying about the engagement, when Robali first came to the Blue and Green Gully, which is our project at year that's funded um, by Jeff Small Grants program, we put a shovel in his hand. And this young Harrisonian, Jade is laughing, first scooped with the shovel and he nearly went flying. And we keep on saying to my mom and to all the people, you don't teach us, you don't engage us. So we have been having a lot of fun in the Blue and Green Gully, putting shovels and cutlasses into the hands of these budding lawyers and biochemists and computer science majors. And we are having tremendous fun while learning. So I'm, I'm again grateful for these young people for coming out and showing others that that balance of the academics as well as the very practical um, field work is something that all of us can engage in. So I will, uh, we had another comment, adding environmental climate mitigation adaptation, um, harmonized general agricultural mechanism should also be considered. Um, so active feedback from our audience as well. Jade and Shawnee, somebody mentioned, flowing from Robadi's comment about the computer science, TikTok, and how young people interact with technology in a different way um, from how we do and what place that can have as far as medicine in your garden for the future. So I'll let you share. Yeah, so last night we were essentially saying that um, bringing the point Western is always said to be better, but that's not necessarily the case. And you find a lot of more indigenous practices being used by a lot of the young people. And I think that this is because now the information about those indigenous practices and, and the traditional medicines are now more readily available to the young people. And I brought the um, point of TikTok, even though it's not a super formal platform, um, it is a big platform. And the concept of TikTok is that you can essentially scroll forever and it will never run out. So there's a constant flow of information into the young people, especially the ones that spend a lot of time on the platform or just on devices in general. So when you have all of these, they're professionals on the app, um, obviously not saying that you need to take every single thing you hear on there and you know run with it, but there are professionals, that, there are people that are very knowledgeable about the different practices and they're able to very easily share the knowledge that, you would, that they have with other people. So another thing that I thought about when Rabali was talking about um, um, trying to grow the, the virtual plants was in our future now, Using this system, if it's able to be um, further developed, we're able to now have a lot more access to the different plants that maybe you might not be able to find here in Barbados and maybe able to like maybe find it in China or something with a dip somewhere with a different climate. And using this virtual plant technology, you're able to now bring it to a place like Barbados and we're able to have the um, interactions with the different plants, the different foods that will obviously nourish our body and one thing that I think Dr. David Bueno said was the actual interaction. Um, like when we go into the Blue and Green Gully and we have the quote unquote break from school and we're able to really interact with nature. One thing that I, I would have seen when I was reading up was essentially our five senses and how we take in the information about nature. And that also assists in the way that um, nature could be medicine for us. Obviously not taking it like orally, but um, different studies on like color theory and how we would see the color green and how that would make us feel and all of that contributes to to wellness so combining all of these things combining the information that we're given on the different platforms combining the new technologies that we're developing and combining the interactions with nature i think that the future and the young people's future is is really heading in the direction of being able to to, to get to get back those indigenous practices and really coming away from the more pharmaceutical medicines yeah um if I could just make a small contribution here, um, everything that I heard, you know, over the past five to 10 minutes have been just extremely fabulous. And, and having the youth being a part of this is, is very important. And, and taking these uh, new approaches um, towards preserving what was indigenously ours. Um, so just coming from Sean's presentation yesterday, 
um, hearing that the Caribbean itself is one of the top plant biodiversity hotspots in the world is significant. And that is something that we should try and maintain. And, and do you know how we have gotten there? We have gotten there through the, uh, through the convergence of different cultures. People coming into the Caribbean started with forced migration through slavery. Um, you know, and of course we have to remember our indigenous um, people, um, but we had Europeans, we have indentured laborers and they brought their culture, they brought their practices and they also brought plants. But the plants that have been able to grow in this region were plants that were essentially suited for our tropical climate. Now being able to identify a plant in China or a plant in Europe or a plant in North America, South America, right? Um, Sean was able to show where one of the plants that he identified actually grew within the volcano in St. Vincent, but now being able to identify and pull this plant by diversity, even in our Caribbean setting and, and plant diversity that has these very important health effects and then being able to simulate their growth through a computer-based software and then create that natural environment for that plant to grow so that we can benefit from that plant is a very important step towards um, value added and enhancing what we already have. Um, so I do support that. Um, Rivali, the, Rivali, sorry, the only thing I would add to that is um, later in my presentation, I will speak about um, in silico experimentation where after you have now grown your plant in that electronic um, interface, uh, I can also remove compounds from that plants and place them in my in silico laboratory environment and actually tell um, you know, medical health fraternity if that plant compound can actually interact with specific targets in our body to bring about uh, potentially uh, medicinal effects. And I could also speak about the safety as well. So we could use technology right, uh, to enhance our very traditional indigenous approaches to make them more mainstream. And I think this is where the youth come in because the youth, of course, are the ones who are going to take this forward, you know, trying to build and create a better and safer future um, for further generations to come. Excellent, excellent. Uh, we have a comment um, in the chat that says a TikTok stitching trend could be used to generate youth engagement and validate their existing traditional medicine knowledge. So that's a good jump off to, to look at a comment um, that Dr. Peter made, and this was on the radio program on Monday when we had a chance to talk about um, the garden pharmacy. And by the end of the discussion, um, I know David and Dr. Peter were both talking about looking at the policy framework. What she mentioned was that I believe, and I, I could be wrong, so I'll stand corrected, in Europe, after maybe about 30 years, I forget the exact amount of time, but after about 30 years of using what we might call traditional medicine, and it's been documented and proven, it is then accepted. And I take that to mean, let's say after 30 years of someone going to um, Chantel Selman and getting some tinctures, you know, and using this thing for 30 years, we might see a time where you go to your pharmacy and you're able to get pictures just as you would the, um, and, and, and my next question is going to be on the use of the terms, but just as you would get the typical medicine that is now available in the pharmacy. You see, I think a part of our socialization is continuing to use the words and continuing to use the definitions, which you know create that, that little channel on our brains that continues the Oxford language when it said, concern with what is generally held to be acceptable at the expense of individuality or sincerity. That was one definition for conventional. So when we talk about conventional medicine, is it that we're concerned with what is generally held to be acceptable? And is it at the expense of our local, our individual, our Bajan medicine and across the region that is in the garden? See, I, I think that could be, Marsha, because one thing that stood out, especially when I think Dr. David Beno was speaking, is the ease of um, attaining these things. When you go to the doctor, the doctor does all of the work and research for you, and he tells you, take this tablet once a day with water, and you go home, and you just put the tablet in your mouth and take your water. But if you were to, especially in this day and age, go toward more natural medicines, you probably have to go and 
fire tree leaves and then come and grind the leaves in a mortar and pestle. So it's, it's really, I see that cannot be ease of having these things. If you have the money to get the things, you'll be able to get them. If not, you probably are like forced to go and get more than pencil, et cetera. So I would, so, throw, I would throw something in there at you, Shawnee, as you talked about going and foraging for the leaves. And, and I, Jade is smiling because she knows where I'm going. If you look at my mom and her physique, and, and she's always saying, I don't know what you're talking about. My mom is ripped. I think that's what the young people say. Her muscle tone is amazing. I myself start, I can't show them, but started getting a few guns as I've started going um, down in the blue and green gully. So as opposed to going to a gym and spending money, I'm going uphill and downhill. I don't need a stairmaster. Is there anything? So we may think that it's a challenge or it's not as easy for us to have access, but what we're actually doing in the process is still getting more healthy. So when you take the time to have a stroll and you go out in the fresh air and you pick, David described it beautifully, how you would go out and pick some sour salt leaves or some sugar apple leaves, by the time he comes back in and steeps that tea, he's already had a psychological experience, a social experience, and the entire health and well-being that goes along with sipping that tea is actually a positive and impactful. So I very much take your point, and what I want to do is, again, to flip it so that we see going out and foraging for the leaves and doing those things and not having it too easy in a pill form is actually a good thing for us and that's part of our heritage and tradition yeah it, so definitely, thank you. Is, it definitely is a good thing and i think that what we need um worldwide probably is a mentality change because even as you said that and i completely agree you know you get many benefits from just going on foraging the exercise etc i think that people right now their mentality is more concerned with comfort than the actual best possible solution so just well taking pills and everything is definitely about the convenience, the comfort, because um, I think as someone in the chat said, that is what is really marketed to us. Um, everything needs to be easier. Everything needs to be more comfortable because I think that that's what people say maybe we're developing toward. At the end of the day, um, hiking and having these great psychological experiences, it is definitely physically taxing. And even though some people may feel better afterward and is overall better for you, um, I think that comfort is where the priorities of people lay. So we definitely need a mentality change in order to really bring about using natural medicines first instead of the pharmaceutical and everything else that we would have talked about in today's session. Yes, definitely. Very well said. And I think, and I think you see it too, not just in terms of medicine, but in every aspect of our, of our lives. As things have become more convenient, as technology has been implemented in so many different things, convenience is a lot. Is often, you know, the first thing that people think they're not going to say. Like Shawnee would have said before, let me go and hunt for this bush and seek this tea so that I can, you know get better i'm just gonna go to the pharmacy and i'm gonna pick up a tablet and i'm gonna be good in the hour so it's interesting to see that as well when you look at um how we are raised as the technology um came into being um our parents really i don't want to say failed us but i remember when i was with marcia at the blue and green gully and we had a volunteer who came with her mother and her mother was, she was working with, you know, the whole and doing this garden where her mother was like, wait, I can tell your father that you're out here doing all of this. I didn't know you could do this. And what she was saying is, uh, what we were saying is that our parents, you know, they're like, well, you don't do this, you don't do that, but we can't do these things if we're not taught to do these things. And it comes into play in, you know, the medicine as well. We're not, the information was lost um about the medicine so we weren't taught it so we're not able to implement it and now that we are able to implement it because of the technology that we have to do the research is like well I, I i have a more convenient um approach to use at this point in time and you know back to what Shanae was saying too as well about hiking and stuff like that is not just to about the physical aspect of um our health but the mental aspect as well we have um, forest, bathing, forest bathing, which is a Japanese practice um, seen as a process of relaxation. So you're spending time in nature, surrounded by mm -hmm. trees, 
and you're not simply just taking a walk you know with a million trees around you you're really making a conscious effort to fully immerse all your senses what are you hearing what are you seeing and you know that goes back to foraging for the leaves to get that medicine it all it all intertwines itself where you have you know your physical well-being but also your psychological your men mental well-being um playing a part in this as well excellent very very well said uh, we have the note that well a few minutes ago we had the note that we only had two minutes left um, so a, a very engaging um and amazing discussion David, I know that you wanted to say a few words, and we know that your session, um, the symposium, come next. So if anyone, <laughs> you're in a position to um, give us a few a few final words, and then if there are questions, we may be, we may be able to take one or two questions. But you've excellent work. Just, David, just, over just to try, you. Just right quickly, I think the panel did an excellent job. I'm really impressed by the quality of young people here on this panel and the information that they shared. Um, I really appreciate it. Just want to make a quick comment in terms of the accessibility and also the convenience of traditional medicine. Yes, we have the engagement in nature, that's important, um, but traditional medicine can also be accessible and convenient, and that's where we go to the value added and take it up the value chain. And this is also need to focus on because we need to cater for different people across the socioeconomic range. <laughs> I wanted to end, let's Before see. That. I don't, do I have it with me? I don't have it with me, but I, I wish I did and we had spoken about it earlier, but with the partnership with the University of the West Indies, I don't know if Damien has Excellent. any, the alginates that oh. we've been able to extract from the sargassum seaweed that is going to, by the time we get to phase two of the blue and green gully, hopefully jettison, jettison us to a place where we have products like for bay leaf sanitizer it's made from the barbados aloe vera aloe vera barbadensa um and then our bay leaf plant here and we're looking forward to a phase two where we can then add seaweed alginates and do more things so we're talking about the plants Perfect. the economy the socialization um linking it all yeah. uh, we have someone who's saying they're very impressed with the contributions i i believe that we're out of time so along with you david i want to thank our youth they have done so excellent it's not just because i'm biased and they're you know yay volunteers but you've done an awesome job and thank you to, to you and dr kohal as well and i will turn things back over to our house to our host dr roxanne way thank you very much Marsha. i agree i i love the energy that young people bring to any discussion uh thank you Marsha rubali shawnee jay dr kohal and um, Dr. Bino for this really lively discussion. The discussion is in fact also very timely in light of the fact that today, April 7th, is World Health Day. I don't know how many of you knew that, but today is World Health Day. And the World Health Organization has chosen for World Health Day 2022, the theme, Our Planet, Our Health. And the focus is, on the actions needed to keep humans and the planet healthy and foster movement to create societies focused on well-being. So I think in some small way or some really big way, this discussion is not only timely, but we're making our contribution to that objective. And I just want to thank the team again, Marsha and, and the youth, for such an interesting dialogue. We're moving into our second session for the morning, where we will take a look at the economics of traditional medicine. We will start off this session with a virtual tour of the Codrington College project. It's a short video, enjoy. Greetings, I'm Michael Clark, Principal of Codrington College. And most persons would know of this institution as the place that trains persons for ministry. But the institution and all its connectedness goes much further back than that. We would have gone all the way back down into the days of slavery and our last owner would have 
given the estates, the Codrington estates, over to the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel with the intention that there be a college situated on the plantation. This plantation has been worked for many, many years, and it is from here over time that we would have noticed that many natural plants would have grown and the community from time to time would have taken many of these plants for their own medicinal purposes. Part of the project that we were engaged in and are still engaged in, it's an ongoing dimension, is the setting of some trails. And what the purpose here is, is that over time, we would have some of our botanists come in and label our trees, label the various vines, label some of the shrubs, so that we can take persons, local and tourists, through our trails and educate them as to the various herbs that are found here in Barbados and specifically here at the Codrington Estates. My name is Michelle Scantabury. I'm the project manager for the medicinal um, plants project as well as the arboretum. This is one of the trails that we have been working on. This tree is the bearded tree tree, which is one of the most historic trees in Barbados. So we've reached the top of the trail, and as you can see, the, we can see East Point Lighthouse. There's St. Mark's Church on the hill, and there's Concept Bay. Here is where we intend to put the platform and some benches and the lookout point. So when you get to the top of the trail, you can take your rest and have your lunch and, and so on. We also intend to create another trail linking this trail with the next one so that when you get here then you can go right across and get to the second trail and then you can go back down the second trail. One of the things that we decided to get into as an institution in connection with the University of West Indies Kefil campus was can we come together and look at some of these stories, some of these stories of medicinal herbs and benefits. Is there any validity to this? Yes, we know our forebears would have used them, but is there any scientific back into this? And so together with Dr. Cohall from the University of West Indies, we decided to embark on this project. Codrington with its connection to the community one and the presence of natural lands where many natural species are growing and the university with its ability to do the research and do the scientific tests that we needed. Together we came up with this medicinal herbs project and it is at this stage now that we're able to share some of what we would have found, what we would have gathered. There is a growing market, as it were, for natural things in Barbados and being able to present them to the community in ways far different from how our forebears would have gone in the bush, pull a few bushes, put them together and steep them in some hot water and then use them for the particular purpose. So nowadays we're able to package them more decently and have them available to the wider public. We join with the Jeff's Small Grants Project and they were able to assist us in providing some of the funding for this particular project. We were also joined by the Organic um, Growers Association. They were able to help us as we are not farmers ourselves. But they were able to provide that aspect of the project for us. My name is John Hunt. I'm a member of the Organic Growers 
Cooperative Society. When we started this project in 2018, we were asked to provide a number of medicinal herbs for the Codrington Medicinal Gardens. These herbs included aloe vera, ginger, turmeric, lemongrass, and blue vervain. The intention was, and still is, to provide these products for a range of finished items that can be used for medicinal purposes throughout the island. So we started in 2018, as I said, where the land had been cleaned and prepared, and we managed to bring in the aloe vera required, which you can see around you, and a number of the other herbs. Obviously doing this organically means that our access to chemicals was completely limited. So using the land as in the condition it's in, we had to find ways to utilize the grass that would grow back up, but we won't be able to use any chemicals to control it. And also, as you can tell, it's very windy up here. So we had to also incorporate a wind break, which you see on the right hand side there, a line of banana trees. This has given us some shade on the soil as well as providing uh, a reduce in moisture loss through evaporation. So in order to facilitate the requirements, we laid out the farm in a permaculture design so that most of these crops would be in the field for a number of years. Some may get hidden in the grass at certain times of the year, but as we clear that grass, you should still be able to find a lot of the herbs out here. There's a system called the cut and drop method of farming. I mean, you won't go back in and cultivate the land again. I'll show you some of the plants that both are wildly um, generated and that we incorporated ourselves. So here you may be familiar with this plant. This is lemongrass. This grows, we planted this three years ago. And as you can see, after a period of time, it starts to dry out. It's still useful at this stage, still can be used. But um, generally you grow it as a green plant. And as it gets older and older, you take some out and you replant it elsewhere. So we'll be able to replant this in future. This plant here, this flower, is called the blue pea vine or Clitora tenera tea. It's actually used in the cocktails by some um, high-end cocktail makers to turn in their drinks a blue color. You put it into the water and it turns the water completely blue. It has no general taste, it's kind of neutral. But it's also very good medicinally for several reasons. They said it helps with women's libido. It's also useful for helping to fight cancer. Um, and there's a, several, there's a list of things that this plant is meant, meant to be good for. It grows on a vine. And we just found it growing naturally out here. So we're trying to maintain it in the garden. It's a slightly invasive species. So if you find it around your house, try harvesting some and putting it into your water and see what benefits you get from it. Well, this is the aloe vera barbendensis. Um, Barbados is actually well renowned for its aloe vera. The plant will grow all year round in, in very dry and rough conditions. As you can see, this soil here is fairly dry. Um, it's mostly chalky. The aloe vera is doing really well. And many might not understand, but aloe vera takes three years to mature before we add to all the medicinal properties. So at this time, this aloe vera will be probably just about right to harvest for the highest quality use for medicinal purposes. And of course, it goes all around the world. I'm sure anywhere that anybody's watching this, they'll be aware of aloe vera. If you look it up, it has the word barbendensis with it, indicating that the qualities of the aloe vera in Barbados is one of the highest in the world. So this can be used in several different ways. Um, it can be used as topical for your skin and it can be also ingested to help with areas of your stomach and colon to keep your body clean. Uh, people use it in hair products, shampoos, uh, face creams, uh, all types of soaps and sanitizers. And this was widely used in our project here at the Medicinal Gardens to make finished items. This is aloe vera barbendensis. So these are some of the products that would have been produced using the plants from the Medicinal Gardens. We would have worked closely with JP Farms Limited, as well as Eden Price Limited to assist us in producing the products. And also training some of the community members in developing products, because the intention is to have some community members become entrepreneurs using some of our um, products. The lemongrass and blue vervain would have been used in teas, as well as some of the ginger and turmeric. The aloe vera would have been used in the soaps as well as the hand sanitizer. We also utilize a bit of the turmeric in producing the soaps. We are thankful to Almighty God for the blessings that He has bestowed upon us in these lands, in the gifts of medicine, and in the beauty that surrounds us that we can look out at. And that in itself, is also a part of wellness, a part of healing. 
So we thank you for joining us and we look forward to sharing more of what we have found over time. Thank you very much for that. What an enlightening video. I think John Hunt is sending me into my garden to look for that little blue flower so that I could make some cocktails this weekend. Um, let's get into our next speaker. Dr. David Bino is an agronomist, economist, and international sustainable development specialist. He's the national coordinator of the Global Environmental Facility Small Grants Program, to which everybody is referring to throughout the duration of this program. Since 2013, he's responsible for managing the local team and his portfolio of projects. Dr. Bino developed and managed the National Organic Research and Development Program during his seven year tenure at the Ministry of Agriculture, Food, Fisheries and Water Resource Management, where he worked as an agronomist. And today he's going to show you the money in traditional medicine. Dr. Bino, all yours. So good morning and welcome again. It is really my pleasure to walk you through the economics of plant biodiversity and traditional medicine. Now, we, when we speak about the economics of plant biodiversity and traditional medicine, um, it is important that we start with a purpose, real purpose. And, you know, purpose is very important. And when we speak about purpose, we must define that. So let's look at some of the objectives within this purpose. Uh, it is it's, it's, it's imperative that we build an awareness of the relationship between um, biodiversity and traditional medicine with reference to the economics. We also must be cognizant of, to highlight briefly, the current state of the science between the state of the science and economics of biodiversity, because that's essential. We also want to provide the key takeaways in terms of the development of this nexus between biodiversity conservation and traditional medicine. Now, we're having this discussion in the context of the Sustainable Development Triangle. And when we speak about this triangle, we're speaking about the economic, the social, and the environmental. Within this triangle, they must all hold as pillars in order for there to be sustainable development. That is development by this current generation that does not put the future generation any worse off. And, and that's important to note. Now, in, in having this dialogue, we also have to set the context with reference to the link between biodiversity ecosystems and their services and the benefit to mankind. And to do so, I'm gonna introduce you to a cascade. And that cascade really puts it in perspective. Now, when we speak about biodiversity at its very foundation, you speak about the biophysical structures of processes. Now, this could be the vegetation. That's a mass when the, the plant is growing, the roots, the trees, the leaves. Um, this is very important. And this leads then to the ecosystem function, that ability to, to hold water, to take carbon dioxide in the form of carbon sequestration to, to, to act as a medium for, for flood, for, for, for water absorption. Those are the functions of the ecosystem. But these, these functions collectively then lead to final services. And when we speak about final services, traditional medicine is part of that final service because in the final service, we have harvestable products. And these harvestable products could be in the leaves, the roots, the fruits, that can then be used for traditional medicine. But beyond these, these harvestal products that we use both in traditional medicine and in the food sector, we also have ecosystem services such as climate, climate regulation, which is very important. And I spoke earlier about this whole process of carbon sequestration where plants, plant biodiversity takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and fixes it in an organic form. And that's an essential service. We also have flood prevention and flood protection, the preservation of the watershed. There's so many ecosystem services, and it's important that we are cognizant of that because often we only think of one ecosystem service in a silo, but there are many. And these then translate to these benefits that we we're speaking about this morning, the benefits to society, 
with reference to health and wellness, with reference to protection, human well-being. And, and that is why we have this team about our planet, our health, because this same biodiversity that leads and builds up to the overall ecosystem that then provides, through the processes, provide ecosystem functions that ultimately provides us with services. And these services bring utility to us, and therefore we value them. But as we go through this presentation, we would understand that how we value them are really the, it's, it's really dynamic. It's not static. And that's why when you had the discussion this morning about um, the youth and the youth dialogue, we spoke about being able to change that value and change how people perceive biodiversity and traditional medicine. Now, in the context, this value, this economic value that we attach to it, is also driven by policy. And at the heart of this, this dialogue and this conversation, this symposium, is really that we want to ultimately change policy where we can facilitate more biodiversity conservation and the uptake of greater use of traditional medicine. So how does this relate? Because if you want to change economic value, then you, you, you'd see that if there's a change in ecosystem services, then economic value will change. But let's backtrack a bit. If there's a change in the biodiversity, then you're going to have a change in the ecosystem services. If there's less biodiversity, you have less ecosystem services. If you have are different and varied. If you have a change in ecosystem function, it impacts the biodiversity that can be supported and ultimately the ecosystem services that will be provided. But let's go further back because if you change land use, if you have issues with climate change and pollution and water use, you're definitely gonna impact your biodiversity and you're definitely gonna impact your change in ecosystem function. But what really influences these factors? Policy, policy at the national level, the regional level, and of course, the international level. And the only way we can change this economic value and how people value biodiversity and how people value traditional medicine is if we can appropriately value it at the national, regional, and global level so that policymakers understand the true value. And the true value can only be understood if you take those non-market values because we often only value traditional medicine because of the money you pay for it. And since we pay less for those, those things, somehow in our mind, they're, they're less valuable because there's so many non-market values that we haven't accounted for. Um, Marshall this morning spoke about the ability to go there and interact with nature, the feeling of mental wellness, the um, physiological and physical wellness that it brings. All these things are non-market values um, that we need to account for so we can properly put an economic value on biodiversity and traditional medicine, not to mention these same ecosystem services that I spoke about earlier. So why? Why is this important? I'm going to tell you why. Because when we look at the context of our world and we take a baseline scenario, um, we're going to see that there's several areas, especially those areas that are heavily um, urbanized and developed, and also those along the equator that are already on the track in terms of the loss of biodiversity. But when we fast forward to 2050, we're going to see that this increases significantly. In fact, we are losing a large chunk of our um, mean species abundance. And that's how you basically me measure it. You look at the, the mean or the average species abundance. And we're going to lose between 72 to 61 percent of our mean species abundance. And in terms of our natural areas, 7.5 million square kilometers, we're going to have some decline in that. So we, we need to understand that if we don't have the biodiversity, then we don't have access to the raw material for traditional medicine. So therefore, the economics of ecosystems of biodiversity, they go hand in hand with traditional medicine and making that also um, viable. So let, let's fast forward and we look at the main drivers of biodiversity loss. Now, this is a global context, but I want to assure you that it is also very closely repl replicated in the context of our current region. Globally, we see that infrastructure development is the main cause of biodiversity loss. And along with that, you're going to see that your sources for traditional medicine are also um, lost at the same time. Then you have followed by that climate change and then crop areas. When you look at the studies within the Caribbean, um, we mentioned fragmentation and the loss of traditional lands as, as, as a high driver. But this is a, akin to infrastructure. Because when you create infrastructure, you actually fragment 
the ecosystem spaces and you fragment the biodiversity. And it is no doubt that climate change has been playing a leading role as it relates to the, the decline of biodiversity, but also in terms of invasive species that would have a negative impact on biodiversity. So I want you to keep that in mind. Now, this thing is only economics. So where are the dollars and cents? I'm going to show you where they are. Because if we look at a 50-year impact in terms of inaction or business as usual, we are set globally to lose about 70%, 7%, sorry, of our gross domestic product globally by 2050. And that's significant. Now, in the context of our natural loss every year, now you're going to see euros at 1.3, but if you put that to be 12, we're talking about trillions of dollars, 1.3 to 3.1 trillion dollars, depending on the discount rate that you use in loss of natural capital. And when that natural capital is lost, it means that it is no longer producing. So you're no longer be able to extract any leaves, roots, bark for traditional medicine. And that's a loss. And that's also not knowledge that is gonna be there, but you can't act on that traditional knowledge because the raw material for that, for that action is no longer there. Now, we can't speak about economics unless we speak about markets. So the traditional medicine um, market size and potential, globally, the complementary and alternative market medicine market size was valued at around 82.27 billion in 2020. But look at this, is expected to expand at a compound annual rate of 22.03% between 2021 and 2028, which means it's expanding before our eyes. And we can't isolated because there's also the global nutritional market, which comprises of both food with health and medicinal benefits. And that market is just huge. $578 billion by 2025 and rising at a rapid speed. And, and this, this rise is basically driven by health concerns. But there's, there's another social um, demographic factor that we spoke about that we have to be very cognizant of the aging population. Those countries like China, Japan with aging populations. And did I mention those countries like Barbados with aging populations? And many within the region are gonna see an increase in the demand for both traditional and nutraceuticals because this is something that is driven by an older demographic. And with our work, we're gonna see a change also more uptake by the younger demographic. But is this something isolated? If you look at the headlines, you're gonna see more reasons why. UN experts warn that of economic costs of loss of species. We're seeing here in the Times, this destroying the world's wildlife cost the economy 40 billion. We're seeing build back biodiversity, the beauty brands leading, uh, lending a hand. We're also seeing let's save the planet in terms of biodiversity. And what's intriguing because China, which is becoming a dominant world power, relies heavily on traditional medicine and specifically to fight the surge of COVID-19 in Shanghai. So these things are important when we ask the question about why. Now, if that wasn't enough, when we look at the global level, there is an alignment at the global level between biodiversity and traditional medicine, linked to the attainment of the SDG, which we'll see all of them listed, all something listed in the right. But the ones we want to zero in on when we speak about this nexus is zero hunger. And it's so amazing that in the context of traditional medicine, that the same thing that we use, the same plant that we use for healing, we also use for food in many cases. So when we speak about traditional medicine and we have this accommodation for that, at the same time, we're accommodating with zero hunger. In addition to that, we're looking at good health and well-being, which is important. And that traditional medicine takes care of that, but at the same time, biodiversity conservation allows for that. Climate action, I spoke about carbon sequestration. Many of the plants that we're exploring within our region, which have significant health benefits, also have significant potential for adaptation to climate change, and also the ability to improve resilience within the context of climate change. We have life below water and we have life on land. So, so this, this nexus is important for sustainable development globally. So if you, didn't, if you didn't need any particular why, you got many, you got several, but let's go beyond market value. And that's where we really need to go beyond market value. When we look at the ecosystem services and public goods, 
which are basically not excludable, not non revivables means that if I can't exclude you from accessing it and you consuming it does not stop me from consuming it. So when we look at the lower level um, aspect of the market, um, like fibers, recreational and tourism, um, these things are normally not public goods in most senses, um, but these are easily quantifiable. But as we get further up and we get to the public goods, such as things like fresh water and climate regulation, water purification, these type of things are very difficult to quantify and value. And that's why we need to go to um, environmental economics and non-market methods of valuation to get the true value of these benefits that both biodiversity and traditional medicine provide. In that context, I want to bring your mind to some of the tools that we have. In the market-based techniques, we have the market price, which is a given. We have the income factor. We have the replacement cost. So let's say we want to replace a particular set of biodiversity. Uh, what is the cost to do that? Um, and the easy example would be if you had um, damage to a particular coral reef and then you had to, to build um, groins along the coast or barrier as you have in the Ghana Sea Wall, what is the replacement cost of replacing that aspect in terms of coastline protection. But of course, there's so many other benefits to coral reefs that the replacement cost is not going to be fully covered because you're only looking at the protection of the coast, but there's so many other benefits. So replacement cost is often very difficult when it comes to those non-market values. Avoidant costs, for example, you have problems with your water, you're staying rust in it, or it looks cloudy or dirty. So avoid the risk of being having a health issue, you go and you buy a bottle of water. Then you can quantify that money that you're spending in bottle of water to see what cost you ascribe then to having clean water. You also have the production function. But when we move to non-market values and non-market techniques, we have reveal preferences. And these are things that you reveal, but you don't know. So when you go and you travel to a particular beach to spend the weekend, or you travel to a particular country to spend your vacation, you choose these things and it reflects whether or not you value um, white sand beaches, whether or not you value um, shopping, do you value more having access to close biodiversity in terms of forests and being able to go on hikes and trails. Um, these things are revealed in the choices that you make when you do go on a vacation or go on a weekend. Hedonic pricing. A good example of this is when you purchase a house. Do you want a house with a pool? Or do you want a house with three bedrooms as opposed to, to um, two bedrooms? Or do you want five? Do you want a two-story house or do you want a, a one-story? So when you buy, make these purchases, economists are able then to go in there and to determine exactly how much you value the pool as opposed to how much you value an, an additional bedroom. And these things are also revealed as it relates to biodiversity. When you engage in visiting um, nature sites, you're then able to break down the components and be able to see then what is your revealed preferences. But then review preferences, there are many cases where you can't have the review preference because there's no real market to exactly review preferences from. And then you have the stated preferences. And this, this whole approach is very, very useful in the context of traditional medicine and biodiversity, where we don't have a very robust traditional medicine or biodiversity um, market setup. Um, so you have something like contingent valuation where you're given some choices and you basically choose between two baseline and based on your reveal, based on your choice, your stated preference, you're then able to take the utility of the particular choice that you made. And then the, the one that, that is a bit more advanced than the contingent valuation choice experiment, on which you don't understand. I heard the young people, uh, some of our youth speaking about um, TikTok, but TikTok is almost like a choice experiment where they're giving you all these different choices and the algorithm is seeing how you're making these choices and then they're able to determine what you value more and what you value less. And they often tend to show you things that they believe would give you high utility. And the last one, of course, benefit transfer analysis. This is where you really don't have a budget to go in there and do the analysis on the site. So you look at another country or another site where the, ex the choice experiment or the review preference has been done, and you then transfer that information to that site to come up with a valuation. So we do have options. The challenge is that within our region, we have not been doing as much valuations as we should. Um, there are several countries who have been doing relatively well. We have a couple studies in Barbados. There are several studies in Jamaica, also in Trinidad. But we need to do much more. 
Um, but when we're doing these studies, I want to bring something to your attention with reference to biodiversity and that relationship with traditional medicine. When we speak about species rich richness, the more species richness you, richness you have, the ability you have to find more medicinal um, values and benefits and uses, because it speaks to the quantity of species and species diversity within a particular area. When you speak about species rarity, so if you identify a specific species in the context of Barbados that is rare or relatively rare, and you're then able to capitalize on that for traditional medicine, what it means is that you may be able to create a geographical indicator and you have a greater premium because that species is rare. In the context of aloe vera, it is not rare, but it was discovered and named here. That's where you have the aloe vera barodensis. So there's a possibility for a geographical in indicator to say, well, look, we have um, some claim to this, this, this um, aloe vera barodensis. Then we speak about biodiversity density. Um, the more dense the, bio the, the biomass, sorry, um, it means that you're able to have more to access and it's possible that it could be accessed and utilized in a more sustainable manner. And this links to the primary productivity. This is a measure of the rate, the natural rate of production of biomass. And that will vary depending on which plant that you're actually using. But you need to look at these dimensions because it actually dictates the type of industry that you can, you can develop and it allows you to have a baseline then to build on. Now, this link between biodiversity and human health is a very rich link. So when we speak about ecosystem services, you have supporting ecosystem services, you have provisioning, you have regulating, and you also have cultural. But what they all do is they go towards ensuring human well-being. And that's why we can't really separate traditional medicine from biodiversity, um, because that link is so strong as established here in this slide. Now, this is what we're getting at, the integration within our economic model. And when I spoke earlier about that value that we're talking about, we need to understand that the value of the market and the potential value has also to be seen in light of the current expenditure that we are placing on health in Barbados. Now, in Barbados, we spend between 6.4 to just over 7% of our GDP. That's, that's, that's three quarters of a billion and upwards close to a billion dollars um, Barbados on our health. And a high portion of that is spent on the importation of pharmaceuticals to, to basically run the health system in Barbados. Now, this is alarming and this is an opportunity when you look at it. And having that context, you have to then look at it from a regional perspective. On average within the region, we spend about 6.6% our gross domestic product on health. And there are countries like Venezuela that spent up upwards to 11%. Well, that's when it was um, in the state of you know, full economic um, productivity. So we need to be cognizant that there's a large market there, even in terms of substitution at the domestic level, for us to enter that market in relation to traditional medicine. But something has to be done. Because when we look at the traditional, um, the triangle and the traditional way in which we look at traditional medicine, uh, we measure ecosystem services, we're going to see that a lot of it at the bottom is, is quant qualitative. So a lot of the information we have is qualitative and um, it speaks about the type of benefits that we may get from these plants, um, from biodiversity. But in terms of quantifying it at the level of the number of people who benefit from, benefit from traditional medicine, the avoided health costs, the persons who actually visit um, these countries because of health tourism, these and, and, and as it relates to traditional medicine, because in countries like um, Guyana and even Jamaica, that is big. We do have a health tourism market here, but we need to develop it further. But the important point here is that we need to move further up the pyramid and um, convert this qualitative information into um, monetary information. And when we can do that, then we are able to make a stronger case for the inclusion of traditional medicine within our healthcare system. And, and that's, that's imperative for us to convince the policymakers. Now, the economic model that I'm speaking about. I think that the best model that we have currently on a terrestrial space would be um, the green economy. What is the green economy? It's an economic system with a strong emphasis on ecosystem well-being within the context of um, social development. So you have the 
social equity, you have care for the environment, you have economic growth, and that all leads to sustainable development. And it's the place, it, perfect place for us to insert biodiversity conservation and traditional medicine. And when we take a focus on this, we have to be able to then contextualize it to a particular country. So if you have to look at Barbados, which is one of the leaders as it relates to the roadmap for the green economy development, Barbados came up with a contextual life definition, which is an integrated production, distribution, consumption, and waste assimilation system that at its core reflects the fragility of small island ecosystems as a basis for, and get this, natural resource protection policy intervention, again, that same plant biodiversity conservation you're speaking about, business and investment choice, we want to develop that in a way that it is influenced by environment and society, then human development programming, which brings this economic development at the heart, brings society and human beings at the heart of development and facilitation of export market development strategies. Because after all, as a small um, island developing state, we are very much um, driven by the foreign exchange that we can generate. So these systems need to be able to generate foreign exchange. In closing, though, I, I must align to my colleague from the economics, the, the um the economics of ecosystem biodiversity, the leader for that team, who said society must urgently replace its defective economic compost so that it does not jeopardize human well-being and planetary health through the undervaluation and consequent loss of ecosystems and biodiversity. And this is important because as we conclude, you would recognize that what this is saying to us that the adoption of the green economy is a necessary and appropriate is necessary and appropriate for incorporating plant biodiversity and traditional medicine within the context of our economic model. We need to go beyond GDP by greening GDP and also including other indicators of development that incorporate human well-being and the environment. So we, we speak about human development index. Um, and these things are important for us to really go beyond GDP. We speak about green content. In addition to that, we have a rich qualitative information heritage as it relates to traditional medicine and is linked to plant biodiversity. But let us transition up the pyramid to ensure that we, that this information, sorry, is quantified and also um, monetized. Economic valuation that considers both market and non-market values, that's critical and it's critically required to communicate to policymakers the urgency of creating effective policy instruments because we can't move and develop um, plant diversity conservation and traditional medicine into engines of economic growth and human well-being unless we have those policy instruments in place. So in concluding, I thank you very much. Um, I think that we've had a very rich discussion and this presentation should be food for thought as to how we're going to move the model forward and ensure that plant biodiversity conservation and traditional medicine is a part of our economic and our sustainable development model. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, Dr. Bino, for taking the time to really explain the link between biodiversity, the ecosystems and their services, including traditional medicines and pharmaceutical products. You did give us more than food for thought. Um, we, we have actions that we must consider, you know, um, pending all those all those things that you've shared with us. Our next presentation I'd like to move on to comes from Dr. Damien Kohal, the Deputy Dean of Preclinical Sciences and Senior Lecturer in Pharmacology at the University of the West Indies Cave Hill Campus. Yesterday, Dr. Kohal showed us how we can use traditional plants to promote health and wellness. And today he's going to show us how our local plants can be transformed to produce new pharmaceutical drugs. Dr. Kohal, all yours. Thank you. Uh, pleasant good morning again, everyone. And yes, my presentation today uh, will touch on some of the content that was shared um, yesterday. And uh, I would just like to take you to this journey by just reflecting on just uh, two quick points coming out of the talks yesterday and also highlighting on what Dr. Bino presented. So yesterday we spoke about um, gathering that very important information from our communities and you saw where uh, a very useful survey uh, was developed uh, to capture information 
um, you know, within the communities of college land. And we saw the video by the Codrington College, which spoke about that project and that process. Uh, the next important point, of course, was the use of these uh, plants to help build health resilience within our communities. And I must highlight uh, or place a disclaimer that even though I'm going to speak about the transition of plants into medicines and may touch on the translation of that medicinal property into pharmaceutical drugs that I am by no means suggesting that that is the way we should go with our, uh, you know, very important uh, flora biodiversity. I believe very much in uh, what, what I call social inclusion, which is ensuring that the benefits of this indigenous knowledge, indigenous practice, and our plant diversity is shared across all stratas of community. So while in one instance, plants can be explored for pharmaceutical products, we should also be open to plants being explored to develop nutraceuticals, cosmeceuticals, and even use safely in their raw form. So let me go through my slides and I will just give you a, a very small synopsis of what I do uh, in my lab at the University of the West Indies. So the title of the presentation is Translating the Local Botanical Pharmacopoeia into New Medicines. So these are my um, main discussion points over the next 10 minutes or so. Uh, I will start off by just, again, recounting some of the historical facts about the use of plants for medicinal purposes. And then I'm going to transition into the drug development pipeline and to outline how we can move these plants into the drug development pipeline. Then I'm going to highlight, uh, very importantly, uh, some important plants that found and used locally that I've actually brought into my lab at the University of the West Indies here at Kville, um, to show you how we move from the process of ident identifying that indigenous practice, that knowledge, and carrying it into the laboratory environment and, uh, and translating those effects into medicines. And then I will offer some concluding remarks. So again, just to highlight, you know, that Met plants have been the cornerstone of our medicinal practices. And some of the very popular drugs that we do uh, consume um, currently, their derivatives are from plants. Uh, let's talk about metformin for diabetes. Let's talk about morphine for severe, uh, moderate to severe pain, uh, and countless other examples. Um, aspirin, right? And the list goes on. So we, we like to highlight that those practices started just about 3000 BC, which is roughly about 5,000 years ago. And what we know from then to now is that plants have still been very important in generating health and wellness for our populations. Between 1981 and 2019, we found out through our own um, scientific inquiry that the FDA approved more than 1,500 drugs made from natural or derivatives of plants, right? Which is very important information. Um, just to also highlight that drugs can come from other natural sources which are not related to plants. They can come from microorganisms. They could come from uh, animals themselves. And I may have time just to highlight a few examples of those. In 2019 alone, 441 small molecule drugs were made directly from natural products and their derivatives. So going back historically, uh, and seeing that we want to speak about the translation of these plants into actual medicines, uh, you know, quote unquote, pharmaceutical products, let's just say that the advent of the pharmaceutical industry started like this as depicted in this slide in the uh, 15th century. And what you're actually looking at is an apothecary, right? And an apothecary um, with my best definition is what would be the founding aspects or component of what we regard today as a pharmacy or even at a grander scale, a pharmaceutical industry. Um, what you're seeing in the slide, of course, are persons there grinding plant material, in a very large mortar and pestle mechanism, we still use mortar and pestle in my labs, right, to grind, to grind plant material. And some persons who may have had experience working in an herbal shop um, 
within the um, current times, we'll still know about mortar and pestle. In fact, within the practice of pharmacy, it is still an important aspect of compounding and formulation. So persons who have a pharmaceutical science background may be able to attest to that. But we see where that apothecary has now moved into what we call the drug development pipeline. Now, the drug development pipeline has three important segments, right? There is what we call drug discovery, which is these two uh, purple um, uh, areas, which are denoted as basic research and early discovery. And then we have the second segment, which is called the preclinical development. And then everything after preclinical development, uh, we consider as clinical development of drugs. Uh, interestingly, uh, persons who have done their research on the drug development pipeline would speak to clinical development being captured in four phases, um, three phases of clinical trials, and then a last phase of what which we call post-market surveillance. And post-market surveillance generally comes after a drug has been approved and placed on the market. However, we still continue to capture information about efficacy and safety. And a lot of us would have known that historically, drugs have been recalled. So these are drugs that were considered to have gone through the drug development pipeline, which roughly takes about 10 to 12 years, right? And some of you are saying it takes that long to develop a drug. Yes, it does, because the clinical development takes up a lot of time and resources. But could you imagine after 10 to 12 years of testing a drug and putting that drug on market, you can still recall it because it doesn't perform appropriately within the given target population. And there have been many examples from the 1960s with uh, talidomide, which was a drug approved for morning sickness. And unfortunately, when pregnant women uh, used talidomide, they were uh, unfortunately had to deal with the blunt of the teratogenic effects associated with the compound, which weren't picked up in early genotoxicity studies at the preclinical level, right? Uh, so they had uh, born children with um, deformities, right, of the appendages primarily, and we call that toxic effect teratogenicity, right? So how do we move plants into that drug development pipeline? And I, and I just want to, again, highlight, you know, just a sample of what we have here in Barbados. Um, you know, speaking about our Barbadian common names, periwinkle, circe, duppy needles, milkweed, castor oil, noni, dog dumpling. These are plants grown all in the wild, right? And as Sean said yesterday, unfortunately, sometimes we call this wild bush, but it's actually very valuable wild bush. And, uh, you know, and of course, we have the various preparation methods and persons have asked me many times, Dr. Paul, are, are, you, are you prescribing the use of these plants by outlining all of this detail? And I say to colleagues that, I, I, I can only recommend plants that have proven to be safe and efficacious, but I generally preach moderation. So if anyone is looking at this slide and wants to follow any of these techniques towards preventative or curative aspects of their current health, I would say do um, these practices if you have to in moderation, right? And I don't preach decoctions, even though decoctions are sometimes important. Decoction is when you boil the plant material. Uh, but I prefer approaches which speak more to infusion, where you take plant material that has been dried, standardized, macerated, and then you add your, uh, your solvent, which could be hot water or it could be um, ethanol in the case of making tinctures, right? And, and of course, um, what about conditions such as cancer? Um, you know, what is my recommendation about the use of alternative therapy? And, and this is where I would say that you need to make sure that you embrace both sides of the fence between traditional and what is considered conventional, uh, because while there are plants that have very useful um, effects, which are which can translate into anti-cancer effects, um, terminal illnesses can be problematic, right? And uh, sometimes persons get desperate due to the terminal nature of those illnesses. And it's always best to get information from both sides and make the best decisions going forward. So this is just a sample, but how do we move this information from what we consider its traditional approach into more mainstream or conventional medicine? So at my lab in the Faculty of Medical Sciences here at Kville, 
uh, within our MPhil PhD program, which we have had just over six years, we have been doing quite a bit of drug discovery and preclinical development of drugs. So we start by first going out in the field, down in St. John's into the communities and identifying plants. And then having done that, and I've asked a bunch of questions to persons who are in that area and have now received that rich information. We take the plants or samples of the plants uh, to my lab. And the first entity is to have an interaction with the herbarium. And that is where I would meet persons such as, um, you know, Professor Carrington, who will help with the appropriate identification of that plant. And that is important because that is how we essentially identify and vulture that plant so that if we go back into the field, we know exactly where to find the plant because consistency, traceability, and standardization is important. It is also important for us to know the time that the plant was harvested, right? And the specific sections are the parts of the plant which have been touted to have medicinal effects. So after doing that identification process, we then do our um, solvent extraction. So if you're looking at my slide, you see a three-point process, right? And if you follow my diagrams, you see me taking my leaves and then I'm doing an extraction. Uh, the extraction is not as simplified as this. We use apparatus such as Soxlet. We also can do percolation where we take the plant material, macerate it, and then we place it in solvent. And then there will be an extraction by the process of diffusion and in some by the process of diffusion, um, mainly, and facilitated diffusion. And um, percolation speaks more about um, the, the use of heat and, again, solvent and recycling that solvent uh, through the plant material many times, getting an enriched uh, uh, solvent extraction process. Now, from our solvent extraction, we get these very unique, interesting phytochemicals, which I described yesterday as the health-based compounds of plants, otherwise known as the secondary metabolites. And we move these compounds from the plant um, through a process of isolation techniques. And while we're doing our isolation, we're testing it on a given target. So one of my students actually discovered some novel compounds from the periwinkle plant, uh, not for cancer, even though it's popular um, for cancer, because we know that there are known anti-cancer compounds from periwinkle, but her work was in the area of diabetes. And she was able to identify compounds that inhibit a very important enzyme in our body. It's called dipeptidyl peptidase 4, right? Now, that enzyme is very important in the regulation of secretion of insulin, right? And what that enzyme does, it actually deactivates incretins, and incretins are biomolecules which actually support insulin secretion. So if we can inhibit that enzyme, we can upregulate insulin secretion in persons with type 2 diabetes myelitis. So, so that's the given response that we want, and we do our dose response curves. You heard me mention earlier dose response. So at a given dose, we expect a response, right? And as we increment that dose on the x-axis, we will see a rise in the response on the y-axis of the curve. Now, that dose response is what we use to apply our thoughts about the therapeutic ability of that substance from the plant. And then we go through some other important steps. Now, extraction uh, within drug discovery can be problematic, and it can be problematic for some of the things that Dr. Bino mentioned earlier, you know, potentially depleting our uh, plant biodiversity. So all efforts must be made in trying to preserve our biodiversity. So while we take from the ecosystem, we need to replenish. But these are just some important things that, that have been overcome since the expiration of plants for drug compounds, right? So as it relates to extraction of compounds from natural sources, you, we may have difficulty in producing the, the plant or the organism, which could be another natural source of a drug with consistent chemotypes outside of its natural habitat. And that generally happens because guess what? Plants grow and thrive in their ecosystem. When you take that plant out of that ecosystem and try to replicate that growth elsewhere, you may not have great success in being able to display the phenotypical expression that would have been observed within that ecosystem, right? So that's a, a very important point. But let's go to the other key important activity guided step, 
Uh, let's talk about the identification of crude and promising pharmacological activity, right? And, uh, and here we may be challenged with the fact that some compounds uh, may lack um, drug properties. So we may want to isolate those compounds or compounds that we really don't know of um, in terms of its biological effects uh, may pose to be problematic. So some of those compounds have to definitely be isolated and separated from the compounds that have the particle effects that we are keen on. Or we may have a situation where we have insufficient amounts of compounds for characterization. But we have developed methods for dereplication, extraction, and improved extraction and uh, refractionation, and that has certainly helped. So throughout the various segments of challenges that have posed moving natural um, products, primary plants, two actual drug compounds we have been able to troubleshoot and come up with solutions that have been quite worthwhile. Another important step that we use in our lab, and you know, this came up in the youth dialogue earlier, was that we're now using more in silico approaches towards drug development. Uh, so I had a student from the Netherlands uh, who is doing a degree in pharmacy, actually a master's degree in pharmaceutical sciences. And he worked with me for six months. And what we essentially did, we pulled the list of local Barbadian plants that are used to manage hypertension. And we were able to use in silico approaches to identify if the compounds from those plants, which we know because they're well published, right? If they posed any therapeutic abilities on the respective targets that we assume these plants would essentially bind to bring about their effects. And also we wanted to see if there were any potential drug interactions that may occur when persons use herbs along with conventional medicine, right? Yesterday in my presentation, I didn't elude one of the important findings coming out of the survey that we did in College Lands, but we know, especially seeing that the, the demography of that population was, was aged, was the elderly, uh, there was a very high prevalence of chronic non-communicable non conditions within that uh, population setting. And interestingly, quite a number of the persons who were actually on conventional medicine for their chronic non communicable condition were also using herbal remedies, right? But one of the critiques by the medical fraternity who practice extensively within the westernized space is that we don't know about the potential drug interactions between plant compounds and conventional medicine. So they generally inform their patients not to use herbs along with conventional medicine. So studies like that will help in providing that information so that doctors then can learn about these drug interactions, right? Uh, to better able to care for their patients. So with in silico approaches, we could actually take a 3D structure of a phytochemical, and we can take a 3D structure of a given target, such as the target I described earlier, to see if that compound will actually bind. And through a series of mathematical computations, we are then able to speak to the binding energies between those two compounds to see if there will be some binding and interaction taking place. So having gone through those steps, the next step, of course, is to move your very um, in vitro or lab-based approach towards drug discovery into preclinical development. And this is where we incorporate our animals. And I must say to all the pet lovers that we don't do random assessment on animals. Everything that we do has to be ethically approved, right? And of course, we do care for animals. And before you can actually do experiments on animals, you have to go through a whole series of courses which speak about safe and appropriate handling and use of animals right? Animals should not be made to suffer um, during experimentation. And if they have to suffer, then, uh, then clearly the benefits must outweigh the risks associated with the sufferation. And, uh, and it's a very detailed code of ethics that is required before you can actually get involved in animal studies. So these isolated compounds that we get from plants, what we would do, we would create a disease model in our animals. So in my lab, we do a type 2 diabetes model for um, our postgraduate students. We use a drug compound called streptozotocin, which was used as an anti-cancer compound uh, previously. 
right? And to a limited extent currently. And that drug essentially uh, wears down the pancreas for a lack of a better word, right? So the pancreas doesn't produce sufficient insulin levels. And we also give the animal a high fat diet. So now that animal actually mimics what would be a human model of type two diabetes. And then we will administer our compounds. And of course, we replicate our drug dose response to see if those effects are translatable. So what are some of the key impacts of our research? Um, you know, we focus primarily on drug discovery and preclinical development. Some of you may be wondering, why is it that we don't go into the clinical development and then actually produce these drugs? But remember, as I said, when I was speaking about the drug development pipeline, is that you're talking about 10 to 12, sometimes 15 years. And some of you are wondering, really, so how did they come up with those COVID vaccines so fast? And, and if you have the right resources, if you're a Pfizer or a Moderna um, or Johnson um, and Johnson, you could potentially, you know, have the resources to be able to condense that 12 year drug development pipeline within a space of a year or two. Right. And of course, having scientists working from various um, you know, sides of the globe, Western, Eastern hemisphere coming together, you could accelerate drug development. And, in, and there are specific times when drug development have to be accelerated. Right. So you will hear about emergency use authorization by um, some drug regulatory entities such as the FDA. And, and that is generally when you have a severe public health uh, crisis. Right. So the pandemic was one. Hence, we had a lot of vaccines that were actually used before they got FDA approval. But we want to take our drug discovery and preclinical work to inform clinical development of drugs. Right. Uh, we believe that there is a potential to develop a biotechnology industry within the Caribbean, utilizing our plant biodiversity, but replenishing them, of course, at the same time. Biotechnology. How will biotechnology help with that? Well, with biotechnology, we can now be able to venture into areas of biosynthesis of uh, specific compounds from plants. So we don't just depend on the plant. I didn't say chemical synthesis, I said biosynthesis, right? Uh, because of techniques. So biotechnology is a very important aspect of that. Uh, uh, required steps towards building a rich, uh, you know, uh, biodiverse, translatable um, pharmaceutical uh, medicine industry. And of course, because of social inclusion, and I preach social inclusion, we want to also ensure that we have rigorous science which speaks to safety and efficacy, which could help in identifying alternative and complementary medicine for all strata of community. So, so after preclinical development, you then of course, move into your clinical development phases, starting with phase one, which is primarily in healthy uh, individuals. Then you move into your more disease states at phase two, which is a smaller uh, uh, human trial or trial. Sometimes you have a phase 2A, phase 2B trial before you get to your phase three, which is the largest clinical trial. And this is the trial just before that drug meets regulatory approval. But the phase three trial generally requires that the new drug or the new substance is tested and, and of, in one arm and in the other arm, it could be standard therapy. Um, we generally don't do placebo um, within drug development because it's unethical to give a large group of persons with a disease a, a sugar tablet or placebo, right? We would give them standard care, right? Uh, while the new drug is tested in the other arm. And then after phase three, you get regulatory approval, then you go into post-market um, surveillance. But going right back to where we started, what have been our success with natural products in drug development? Uh, so in uh, some data that I gathered from 2008, and I'm sure it would have improved by now, we know that there have been um, various types of natural products, um, a part of drug development, right? And we see just about 225 projects that have actually within that year been through all phases of drug development. And uh, within these 225, we know that 108 were from plants. So you could see plants make up a significant portion of the natural compounds that are actually in drug development. Um, in table two, what you're actually seeing now is the disaggregated data, which actually shows the various conditions where these uh, natural compounds are used. 
And of course, you see cancer, anti-infective, more than likely antibiotics, uh, topping uh, the list of areas um, for those effects. In my lab, we are more keen on anti-diabetic drugs. Uh, we are also keen on drugs that can help with the management of hypertension, right, and ischemic heart disease. And we have ventured into neurological conditions such as epilepsy, primarily with cannabis. So, you know, in wrapping up, um, again, you know, there is a clear connection between our plants historically and still now, as we have just observed, um, with plants moving into drug development. Uh, what we do here at the UWI is primarily focusing on two um, initial stages of drug development, because that is where we have the resources to be able to participate. Uh, we know that some outcome of this could potentially um, lead to possibility of developing a biotechnology industry, which could essentially focus on the identification of medicinal compounds that could inform pharmaceutical products, but could also inform other products such as nutraceuticals, cosmeceuticals, right? Fortified foods or functional foods, because we could take some of these medicinal compounds and, and, and instead of focusing on curative aspects of medicine, focus on preventative, right? Focus on what we consider wellness, health and wellness, right? And uh, true nutraceuticals, cosmeceuticals, and functional foods, um, that itself is a major market that we can tap into. And guess what? Uh, to tap into the wellness paradigm is a lot less extensive than trying to tap into the pharmaceutical paradigm, right? The regulatory requirements are not as robust. Uh, however, health, uh, well, safety and efficacy are still considered paramount. And as I pointed out yesterday, we have a scenario now where we see a growth in the global botanical medicine market, right? Uh, we are estimating hundreds of billions of US dollars for this market. And I believe Barbados, the rest of the Caribbean, being one of the top plant biodiversity hotspots in the world, we should definitely be benefiting from such a market. So this is where I'm going to end. Thank you for your attention. And I'll be happy to take questions in that segment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kohal. We actually do have a question that has been uh, placed in the chat for, for quite some time now, um, coming from Susan Mohan, Mahon, Susan Mahon. And she's asking, has your lab undertaken any research on the pharmaceutical properties of marine organisms, such as sea fans, seaweeds, and sponges? And quick answer to that, most of our efforts so far has been on land species, uh, but you'd have heard Marsha made some comments recently, one of our recent exploits. And, and let me just put this out there that where I can, where I can extend myself, I'm happy to assist uh, persons out there who are young budding entrepreneurs who have ideas and would like to find a, a, a research lab to help them bring their ideas to life. And, and Marsha came to me with an idea about, um, you know, using some of this, uh, you know, beached um, seaweed uh, biomass that has came to our shores um, over the past decade or so. I'm speaking about the infamous sargasm. And um, through my lab with my postgrad students, we were able to extract alginates. Now, alginates are very important by my <clears throat> biomedical, is a very important biomedical molecule. It's a polymer. It is used for um, drug delivery systems. It also has other important properties such as hydration, among other key medicinal uses, right? And, and we have been able to extract these alginates and, um, and Marsha alluded to the point that she now is going to incorporate these alginates into some of her products uh, that she make uh, with her, her, her youth um, uh, uh, movement group, right? So, so we have dwelled to some extent into marine species uh, at that level, but most of our research have been on land species, right? So in my lab, we use a lot of periwinkle, um, Cersei bush, right? Um, they're um, seen on the leaf. We, we focus on traditional Barbadian uh, medicinal plants. Susan, I think the short answer to that is check Dr. Kohol when you get a chance, okay? Sure. Um, but thank you so much for that. Uh, Dr. Kohal, and she's also saying thank you very much in terms of the sargassum and that. I'm also going to direct a question to any of the panelists who are willing 
um, who are listening and who, who would want to answer this question. Um, it comes from somebody who's joining us on Facebook. And he says, his name is Dennis Sobers. And he says, I have a forest hand in North and have called, written, texted with no response to my request to identify the plants that are growing here. It's mm-hmm. time to stop wasting time and do what everybody else does and just push down the trees and subdivide the land and lots for residential purposes. It's all talk and no will. Any comments from the panelists regarding this um, viewer? Yes. Um, well, let me just say, I, I believe I may have missed um, this message from uh, the colleague that you just mentioned who would have made a comment. Um, yesterday, um, I was just going through my mobile device and I happened to go in my messenger and I realized that there were some unread messages. Um, and that's not a, a app that I use all the time. Um, but where possible, um, of course, we're always willing to engage. I mean, I can, I mean, Sonia has been doing that level of engagement. I have been doing that level of engagement and other persons as well. And guess what? We have quite a number of knowledgeable persons in Barbados. You would be surprised based on the amount of knowledge that is out there, uh, especially among our aging population, who can do far better at identifying some of these plants and mm. speak about their uses. Um, and, and what, the, co- and what the, the person mentioned is exactly not what we want to do. We don't want to, you know, um, erode our agricultural lands, right, um, our natural forest areas um, to build more homes, right? The, 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 that is actually pushing us away from the, the wellness spectrum that I highlighted earlier. We want to keep as much greenery um, uh, within our um, environs as much as possible. And to add to something David mentioned in terms of policy, what I would also like to see going forward in Barbados is more policies that focus on preserving natural forests, um, preserving even natural green areas around homes. People are building these massive homes now with no green space, no lawns, no trees, no gardens. Right, the pe- some person's idea of a garden is getting a, a drum and cutting it in a half and putting it somewhere, right? But we need the plants to grow in their natural ecosystem. So I, I, I know persons like John, you know, it can, could speak to this as well. And you know, um, you have a lot of passionate persons about the green landscape, and, and we have to maintain as much as that uh, as possible. Okay, thank you very much for that, Dr. Kohal. I don't know if Dr. Bino wanted to weigh in on the comment made by the person on, on Facebook as well. I think that the, I can understand the frustration by a gentleman that would have um, said what he would have said in his in the comments. I read it as well. Um, but, you, you know, he really has a very important resource. Um, the policy that is in place is mostly you know, allowing him then to change land usage. And, and therefore, um, that is good in a sense because if we are too lenient with our policy, then we're gonna lose the little um, biodiversity that we, we have remaining. Um, it would be good if he can look at how he can maximize that opportunity of having that land because since spaces like his is relatively rare, then it means that he can utilize it um, in terms of ecotourism, in terms of being able to um, capitalize on the natural ecosystem there. Um, I don't want to go too much further into that because I, we still have a couple presentations and I know we're running behind time, but that's an interesting discussion that we can definitely have. Okay, thank you very much for that, Dr. Bino. And I also want to thank Dr. Kohal for showing us how all local plants have the potential to produce new medicines. The scientific research at UWE actually sounds very promising and very exciting. And I especially appreciated the cautionary note regarding the pairing of traditional medicine with conventional or newer medicines for like terminal illnesses and that. Thank you very much. Now we move on to our next presenter. We're moving from the garden to the market. Our next presenter is Mr. John Hunt. He's the secretary of the Organic Growers Cooperative Society Limited. He has founded or co-founded grassroots organizations, including Borden Environmental Park Group, the St. Andrew Small Farmers and Cottage Industry Cooperative, Cotton Inspirations, which is a gender-sensitive cottage cottage industry, Slow Food Barbados, 
chapter and the Organic Growers and Consumers Association. He's trained and certified in permaculture design and works within the core of community agriculture. His focus areas include agroforestry and biodynamic farming. John, we've been waiting. Welcome. Nice to, uh, welcome, everybody. Um, nice to see everyone. Hello, Roxanne. Long time. Um, well, my presentation is based around how we go from the traditional medicinal plants that we have to the marketplace. So in recognizing that, I think we, we may have touched on the subject before, but a lot of what we call traditional medicines are not really planted for their medicinal properties. They have like a dual purpose. So I know people may recall when their granny or mum would go outside and come back in the house with a bunch of leaves or bush, quite often from very close around the house. Um, and these things weren't really planted and taken care of or revered in any special way. They were just used when the need came about. So at the first sign of a, a cough or a fever, these bush and, and leaves would appear or seemingly appear. But really, a lot of what these leaves came from were fruit trees, and they still are fruit trees that we have around us and we can plant close around our home. So you have like the guava tree with its antibacterial properties. You have papaya tree, um, which has such certain antiviral properties. You have the immune boosting soursop tree. Um, the leaves from the soursop are often used in teas. Uh, I know a friend of mine was saying that the cashew root was often used to help with things like diarrhea. If people had diarrhea, they would boil the cashew root from the cashew tree. The pear tree, um, that's often used as well. So even this morning, I took a walk around my property, just around my house in St. Thomas, and I came back with lots of different leaves. You have your papaw, my papaw leaf. So I can make a tea with this. I'll bring it into juice. The almond, almond leaf. There's an almond tree in front of me as well. That's part of our property. And it's not a huge property. It's really a more semi-residential area. I took something from my neighbor's garden, which is the Calais plant. It's also a very good medicine. And if we look around our properties, you'd be surprised how many different medicinal things there are your pear leaf, which is out there. We have pear trees around us. Obviously, there's the blue vervain, which you'll find growing almost everywhere in Barbados if you're not spraying chemicals around. And my um, moringa tree is getting so tall, it grows so fast, I could barely get a couple of leaves off of it. But all these things would be the trees that would grow around us, except the vervain, obviously, but trees and bushes that we kind of take for granted that are around us. Um, the one thing in common with most of these plants, and we all know the, the bay leaf, which is a, a friend of mine gave me some bay leaf, and you'll wonder world. So this is just walking around my garden, around me, around this house. And I'm sure if you do it around your house, you'll come up with two or three different herbs that can be used either as tonics, um, which is generally how they were used, or as medicine. The good, per the good thing about these multi-purpose trees is that you have a, a primary use, which is the fruits which actually help to keep you from getting ill because of the vitamin and mineral content of your fruits. And then out of season, we have the use of the plants for their bark, their leaves, or sometimes their roots. So the medicinal properties of, of plants isn't necessarily a sole, um, a sole use purpose. There's lots of multi-purpose uses for traditional things. And I think one of the reasons they remain or become traditional is because they're so hardy, because they can be found in temperate in areas where the soil isn't necessarily best soil. Um, you know, it can be very dry in certain areas and you'll still find some of these very hardy plants growing. Another benefit of their traditional use is that they generally can self-replicate very easily. So the wonder world, for instance, as soon as a leaf touches a piece of soil, it will start to grow again. And the Cerasea bush, I have a little bit of Cerasea around me and it's been around my property for years now. Um, Sometimes my son uses the weed whacker when he cuts it back, but it will spring back again and again. They're almost like invasive species. So traditional herbs are those types of hardy crops that grow well in the natural environment. They can take shade, they can take poor conditions or marginal conditions. And it's the knowledge about them. It's their, their values in how people have, have known about them and have used them and retain them. So besides sitting under that almond tree for shade, maybe making something from the wood, a walking stick. Um, you also have the use of the leaf and the bark and fruits. So when we think of traditional, it's that 
traditional use beyond medicine, which is really why they stay in that realm of traditional use. So we have um, in our organization, the Organic Growers Consumers, we market what is most readily available to people and let them know that it's marketable. So things like our wellness blend would be a selection of um, palatable, let's say the palatable leaves. So it'd be a leaf might be mixed with some lemongrass, uh, also some pear leaf because of the nice flavor and you know, cooling sensation you get from pear leaf. And we would put that together in a package and people are, are receiving these very well. Um, even since, or more so since the beginning of the pandemic, and people are looking at ways to in, increase their immunovitality. They're trying to find ways to stay well. And they realize that medicine is okay after the fact, and it reacts differently to different people at that time. But there's also the traditional method of keeping yourself healthy by using more of your fruits and the occasional cup of, of um, bay leaf tea or putting a little bay leaf in your cooking. These types of attitudes towards medicine is what helps to keep foods and medicines getting into the marketplace because people aren't, they're kind of aware of the fact that this is a good property. They've heard about the, the bay leaf, they've heard about the pear tree leaf, the sour sock leaf. So there's not as though it's a name they can hardly understand or, um, you know, it's a great scientific title behind it. So keeping that in mind, it's important that the traditional information, the, the traditional messages about these plants is passed on. And as our society has become more urbanized, more residential uh, and more nuclear, where the grandparents and the extended family aren't the norm anymore, that, that passing on of information from generation to generation has been diluted somewhat. And it's been revamped in a way through the labeling used in marketing. So when a product now comes to the market in a bottle or a container, the label is passing on that information. It's telling a, a consumer what is used for however many years as a traditional way of managing or reducing the symptoms of and of whatever particular ailment that the, the, the product might be good for. I know, for instance, I've had dengue. And when I had dengue and I thought I was going to pass away, a friend of mine said, John, get a little papali crush your papal leaf into a, in a mortar and pestle and take a sip of that and you'll be right as rain. And literally within a day or so, I was back to myself. So that kind of information that has to be transposed onto labeling because we're losing that generational legacy to some extent. And it's important that the artisanal, artisanal producer recognizing how he can be a part of this whole diversity in, in looking at medicine and health and managing the environment. I've kept my presentation short because I know we are running behind time, um, but I welcome any questions at the time that's most suited. Thank you, Dr. Wiff and Dr. Bino for inviting me in. I love the message on your shirt, Trust Organic. And I actually had a question for you with regard to the almond leaves. What do you use almond leaves for? Because I have like two almond trees in my yard and I'm like, He's talking about almond leaves. I haven't drunk anything with almond yet. So can you share, um, John, what the almond leaf treats or what it's good for? There are certain vitamins. I think it's widely used in Grenada, uh, not so much in Barbados, but within the Caribbean, you'll find different jurisdictions have found various uses for their plants. So I first heard about the use of it from a Grenadian friend who said they use the leaves when they're particularly turning certain colors with different properties. So, you know, a little bit of research into what the uses of it, I, I will do some more myself, but it's a good question. I'll try and get back to you. Okay. Thank you for that. The other thing that you mentioned, John, you, you said that you package leaves um, for sale or to market and, and it's being well received. Yeah. You said, is this uh, local and, and where can, you know, where can we get this? Well, we, we were sending out, because of the pandemic, we kind of changed our marketing strategy. So we send out a list to several people about what the farmers from our organization have available. So when we put the wellness blend on the list, we found that a number of people were finding, wanted to find out what this wellness blend is. So it's mm -hmm. like I say, a selection of different leaves. They're tasty. They're not the types that might be bitter or astringent, not like the Sarah sea bushes. Um, and we found that people like them and they tell their friends they can get this selection. So we're about to open up an outlet in Warrens in the St. Michael area of Barbados, um, very close to the banking central area there in Warrens. 
Mm -hmm. um, that small roundabout. So we hope you're welcome from next week. So you can pass by, take a look at what we have available, uh, maybe order something that you need online, and then come and pick it up. Okay, thank you for that. And thanks for taking us from the garden to the market, John. It's always great to see you. Okay, nice to see you too. Thanks. All right. Okay, so our final presentation, we're about winding down, folks. Our final presentation for the day comes from Dr. Sonia Peter, who will take a look at underutilized plants as new crops for food security and health. I'm, go I'm going to turn right over to you, Dr. Peter. I do have a question in the chat later on for Dr. Kohal, so be on standby for that. And we'll take the questions for both Dr. Kohal and Dr. Peter at the end of her presentation. Dr. Peter, all yours. Um, I want to say um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Waith, but I wanted to take a little bit of my time to offer hearty congratulations to the student dialogue. Um, it is a pleasure to hear them advocate. Um, this is the generation that we need to place investment uh, because we want to, as Dr. Baino said, have continuity uh, within this discourse as we move from qualitative right through to monetary value of our biodiversity. Um, also, in case I forget this, all of the speakers um, over the two days have given excellent presentations. And I know that those in attendance or viewing on Facebook would have become educated and energized um, to look at how they can play a role in the conservation of our resource and also the use of the resource. So I'm going to be closing up the symposium looking at underutilized plants as new crops for food security and health. And I'm starting with this lovely vibrant image. Um, this, of course, we have got um, food items here um, that are some not grown on island, but the value of an image like this is that it reflects uh, the importance of um, color and texture in food. Uh, we see we have the, the purple cabbage, we have the pomegranate, we have the berries, we have the greens, and all of these provide nutrients and nutrition that it is all good. It's all good for metabolic health. We have the nuts that give us the fatty acids that are important for our biochemical systems. And the point of my presentation is to share, um, I think I have about five plants that are grown on island. Uh, three, maybe not so common in terms of uh, the knowledge of their value. Uh, two of them, I think pretty common, but the point is, are we using them to their maximum potential? I'm, I'm arguing no. I just want to also um, get into my presentation by looking at this extract um, from an interview um, that was placed within a Forbes, um, not a journal, but an entry um, that, that business um, and, you know, searching for that word there is not following up. Uh, but the importance here is that the uh, Minister of Agriculture was reinforcing that our food bill is too high. 325 million in food imports and approximately 90% of that is domestically consumed. It says 88 million of this expense being attributed to primary agricultural goods, such as lettuce and onions, um, indicative that we have to do better here. Also interesting is this program that has been uh, implemented by the Ministry of Agriculture um, Feed Program, which stands for Farmers Empowerment and Enfran Enfranchisement Drive. And the uh, impetus here is to improve our national um, food and nutrition security, um, and ultimately to cut down on our food imports. The slogan speaks volumes. It says, health and wealth, living what I eat. And I bring this up because it is happy to see that there's a framework on which we can build, um, on which this movement going forward um, is going to receive support from our governmental entities, because we need that buy-in 
to get to that top of that pyramid where we begin to monetize our biodiversity. So like I said, we're going to look at five of the species that I think are worthy of consideration within this model. And, and the, the Biocultural Education and Research Program has an approach of modeling the biodiversity we have here within this framework of food security and health. Um, what are the properties of our plants? We've heard all the speakers before um, reinforcing uh, this molecular value, this value at the molecular level. And we need to begin to look at this within a more practical perspective as it relates to agriculture. And this is what we have begun to do. So this is my first plant that I want us to look at. This common um, plant, and I say common because it's grown naturally in high rainfall areas. It is described as a tall shrub. I don't know if anyone recognizes it um, who's in the audience or viewing. It has the most beautiful flower, but our interest is the fruit, which is called turkey berry. Now, this plant is related to the tomato plant. Uh, this is called Solanum torvan. The um, tomato plant is of the same genus but it's a different species, of course. It's called Solanum lycopersicum. So this is a close neighbor um, or relative of the tomato plant. And if you look at the fruit, you can see a similarity in terms of the shape and features of that fruit. And therefore its use as a vegetable is indicated. Uh, apparently, this was important as a vegetable in earlier times on the island, but we are hearing a lot about the disconnection between our past and our present, and uh, the confidence has been eroded. We heard the young people speaking a lot about safety and not being aware of the value of the plants, and this is because of uh, limitations in knowledge transfer and there's a lot of um, sociological influence here that would have impacted on this limited knowledge transfer. A lot of it is wrapped up into the stigma um, based on our history. But getting back to this plant, um, let's look at the nutritional information on this plant as it relates to um, health. This plant is a reasonably good source of fiber. We see 22% it offers per 100 gram of recommended daily allowance. We also see that it is um, a very useful source of iron with giving us 57% um, per 100 grams of that um, fruit um, according to the recommended daily allowance. Um, and it's important to know these um, facts about our plants, and I take the point, I think, of a question that was raised, um, that this is the issue when it comes to confidence. We have the plants, yes, and we can tell you that it has natural agents that are good, uh, but we need to get this quality of information to you um, to enhance your confidence. We also see um, here that it's low carbohydrate. Um, it has some protein to offer us, and it has um, other agents that are good for health, the beta carotene, which is a great antioxidant helping with the free radical load in our body and ascorbic acid, which we know commonly as vitamin C. So I'm proposing that this is a plant that we need to give close look at in terms of uh, reintroducing it into our food culture. And uh, before we do that, of course, we need to do our growth studies um, in terms of recommending it as a crop for agriculture. I want to state here that um, we work closely with JMP Farms Limited, and we have what I would consider as the beginnings of a demonstration kitchen. It's called the Farmer's Kitchen. And we recently had a dinner based around um, the plants that I'm going to be introducing here, the first three plants, and this is one of them that the director, Bernice Chase, um, showed us how she prepares it. 
within the farmer's kitchen. And it was um, given to us as a side dish. And it really did add both nutrition, as you can see here, and flavor to the menu. And we are hoping um, to repeat this in the form of a breakfast. Um, and so those who are interested can listen out because it will be plant-based. And these are going to be the quality of plants that we're using, the plants from our tradition that we have lost connection with. The next I want to look at is what we call wild spinach, Amaranthus dubious. Here it is shown actually growing uh, within my version of an ethnobotanical garden in my backyard. I remember my grandmother who didn't have a lot of space, but she had that tradition close to her heart and whatever she could grow in her backyard, which actually happened to be somewhat rocky. She never hesitated thinking about how can I grow? She just said, let me see what I can grow. Um, so here we have Amaranthus dubious growing well, you can see among the aloe and other species. Um, I am fascinated by this plant having done the research. This plant sits in the soil and it bioaccumulates all the goodness in the soil. And you're going to see shortly what I speak of when I say bioaccumulate. So this, um, I'll just tell you its description. It's described as an erect shrubby herb. Um, it has stout branch reddish stems. It grows with ease. It loves our soil. And I think that persons typically pull this up as a weed around the home, but our Caribbean neighbors have embraced this and it is used as a greens. I think it is also used in the preparation of kalalu as a substitute. But what is the value of this plant? And I know that the um, font here is um, probably not of the recommended size, but I have extracted the key points that I want to focus on. And uh, the richness in the vitamin complement in this plant is absolutely amazing to me. Uh, we see that it offers 97% of the recommended daily allowance of vitamin A. Vitamin A is good for eye health and uh, boosting the immune system for growth and reproduction. Vitamin C, it offers 71% of the recommended daily allowance of vitamin C. Vitamin C has been receiving a lot of research. As a chemist, um, I was enthused by Linus Pauling, um, he devoted his later work in the 1970s to the benefits of vitamin C, and he felt that vitamin C was going to be the cure for everything, all of the health problems we had, to the point where he was taking, around his death, 18,000 milligrams of vitamin C per day. Um, the research coming out, he established an institute um, to, to do work on vitamin C research. And though all of it has not supported um, his ideas, um, he is one of the scientists that I really do think um, had a passion for transferring the chemical knowledge into useful knowledge um, that communities can embrace. And um, here, this plant is offering 71% of vitamin C. We know that if you want to boost our immune system, um, vitamin C is indicated. Um, it's good for vascular health. And uh, apparently, um, it's also good for memory, uh, especially as we age. And we know colds and flu, you resort to vitamin C. Vitamin K, look at that, 950% of the recommended daily allowance provided by this diminutive herb that you pick out of your garden <laughs> with ease. Why? Because you didn't know that. What is vitamin K good for? Vitamin K is good for your bone and blood health and uh, um, indicated in the clotting mechanism within the body. In addition to that, uh, trace minerals, um, copper, 18%. Copper is good for your vascular health. It aids in absorption of other minerals. Calcium, 22%. And we know calcium is good for bone health. Iron, 29%. Um, manganese, 38%. Probably an element that we don't hear mentioned much 
in terms of an important one um, within our mineral complement. But manganese apparently is very important for our um, overall biochemical and metabolic health. It is involved in our muscular system, our bone, hormonal health, brain, and nerve function. And this is trapped in one plant growing in our tropical conditions in our soil, and we're not aware of it. So I am proposing here that this is one of the plants that we need to give that closer look at in terms of a potential for crop development and um, incorporating fully into our um, food culture. We know that there are individuals um, on the island that do this, but it's sporadic when it could be of greater value. In addition to that, it is low carbohydrate and it has other important molecules in there, all linked to good biochemical health. Um, so I am really uh, very enthused about this particular um, plant as one that we need to model for its um, value and its value within our um, biodiversity. So we have started um, to look at monitoring the growth of this plant. Um, here we see um, on this slide, on the left, uh, we have the plant as it was initially introduced into the soil in these, um, I call them trial units provided by All Greens Limited. Um, it, it's a unit that comes covered and allows us to um, duplicate conditions under which the plants grow. Um, there is a drip irrigation system. And on the right, we can see the plant growth that we achieved on uh, six weeks in the ground. And this, is, this trial is located at JMP Farms Limited. And you can see the dramatic increase um, in growth. Um, the extent of branching that is given here in this image um, I am not sure that I've seen that extent of branching um, in a wild condition. And sometimes this happens as the plant responds to the new environment, and it may be responding to the special conditions in the soil as that soil is mixed with compost generated at the farm. And this compost is a mixture of green waste food waste and animal waste, especially from our black belly sheep. Now we couldn't want a better model than this. We're incorporating uh, a permaculture model and we're incorporating um, as much as possible what is special uh, to Barbados. So it's our climate condition, it's our soil condition. Uh, we are generating our own fertilizer. It's not artificial. And at the end of this, we are going to monitor um, the wet mass that we get, we're going to measure the dry mass, and then we're going to incorporate um, the dried material from this plant into some innovative product. Uh, we're planning to have, at the end of our two years of work funded by Jeff, um, a fair where we are going to be exhibiting all of the exciting innovations that we have developed. And we hope to have some very exciting um, agro-processed products out of this. I call it wonder plant. Next we go to um, the herb pusley or purslane, Portulaca oleracea. And I spoke about this in my first presentation where it was used during the period of slavery um, for sore throat. And therefore we would expect that this is a source of vitamin C and other phytonutrients that can mitigate upper respiratory tract infection. But this is also um, a highly valuable plant. And in some circles, it is referred to as a superfood. Now, what is a superfood? I am not one who tends to embrace um, buzzwords, but I think that the, the term superfood is being used in terms of the nutritional value of this plant and there's studies being done and I can share one with you. Um, here's a study looking at the value of the purslane. It's called the weed. Um, and though I do not embrace using the term weed because all plants that photosynthesize 
are playing a role in terms of carbon sequestration. They're playing a role in terms of providing oxygen by the process of photosynthesis. They're playing a role, as we see here, in terms of bioaccumulating all the goodness in the soil and then pushing it through their biosynthetic systems to produce natural products and other nutritional agents. So it says here that this plant um, was great at accumulating potassium, also magnesium and calcium. And I've mentioned about um, the importance of some of these. Uh, magnesium is good for general metabolic function and uh, potassium we know is implicated within our um, nervous system. It also um, is considered to be uh, very valuable as a source of um, omega-3 fatty acids. These omega fatty acids are important for vascular health and also nerve health and uh, the autoimmune diseases. Apparently, they are indicated um, for mitigation against autoimmune diseases. Um, and we see here that uh, it produces um, and stores um, significant amounts of um, the two alpha, sorry, omega-3 fatty acids. Don't worry about the names. Uh, the important thing is the value. So alpha linolenic acid and alpha tocopherol. And the thing about these is that you will hear about um, saturated oils or fats and unsaturated oils. And uh, um, these fatty acids typically have that unsaturation, which is good for vascular health. As I said, so throat, it is also great for ascorbic acid, providing um, about 50, 506 milligrams per 100 grams of fresh dry bait. And our ancestors um, figured that out um, again from their um, trial and error and um, they realized that ascorbic acid, um, as found in costly, would uh, provide some alleviation from sore throat. Um, I can also mention here, as uh, within the student dialogue, there was the talk about um, when do we draw the line and say, uh, we are happy that we have a plant here based on the historical usage and documentation and uh, limits in terms of side effects and uh, be confident enough to have this included within our um, healthcare system. I want to note that there is actually a spray for sore throat developed in Europe and sold over the counter from this purslane plant. So we are also um, adopting this is one of the species that we want to have a focus on. Um, these are three slides um, over which um, we took images to demonstrate um, the growth of the plant over a six week period again. So to the very right of the slide, we have the um, seedlings and you can see how green and fleshy because the plant is indeed a succulent um, in the middle is one of the plants simply singled out to show its structural features. And then what we were doing is monitoring how the plant was growing in that rich soil mixture offered by the compost, which is generated at um, JMP Farms Limited. So over a selection of plants, we measure um, height, we look at um, the leaf distribution, we look at the branching, and uh, this is information that we can report on to anyone who's interested in growing purslane. We have some baseline. Um, this trial collectively has been hampered by uh, the pandemic because we couldn't get out and do the field work. Um, we had um, a student from the University of the West Indies who studied in agriculture in, at St. Augustine campus and he wanted to be involved, um, but he was hampered again because of COVID. So we've had um, some constraints and 
the trial is not as expressed as we wanted it to be, but we still have some baseline data. Now, um, Pusley is, right. Um, we have used this in the farmer's kitchen as well. And at GMP Farms Limited, this has been experimented with as an additive um, in the making of breads. It has been converted into the most delightful soup, um, enriched with other um, vegetables like pumpkin. And uh, this is one, this is the introductory soup that we had at our dinner. Um, and it was very well received. And it was also used as a green topping on pizza. So our farmer's kitchen has also been modeling um, this plant for its value. And uh, having been armed with its growth parameters, um, we are also going to um, collect um, dry mass, wet mass, and then look at shunting this into other innovative product. And these will be also presented at our fair as we wrap up our two years of work. So now I'm moving into um, a plant that you probably are saying, but why are you referring to this as underutilized? Our breadfruit is well entrenched into our food culture. Um, those of us who do enjoy um, that putting on sauce on the weekend, know that it is not putting on sauce unless we have our breadfruit, our pickled breadfruit uh, accommodating um, the dish. Uh, we also use it um, as a substitute um, in our version of cuckoo, where it is um, combed in. Um, so we know that. We know that breadfruit is already entrenched in our culture, our food culture. But my question is, are we maximizing the potential of the breadfruit? And I say no. Um, the breadfruit leaf is also very important to our tradition, uh, being used for both hypertension and diabetes. And there is research that supports that. Um, for hypertension, um, the leaf produces a group of compounds called flavonones, and these are implicated in regulation of arterial size and head pressure. Uh, so the, the support is there in terms of the research, and uh, we're saying that we need to examine the full um, use of this plant. Um, interestingly, however, I'm going to be focusing on the fruit and what else we can do to maximize its potential. Uh, so to look again at its value, um, as a fruit, we know that it is a good source of carbohydrate to the tune of 29% of the recommended daily allowance. It's a source of fiber, protein, and potassium, as mentioned before, in terms of the value of the potassium. It also has uh, minerals, uh, magnesium, and vitamin C. Um, so collectively, this plant offers a lot. And um, research is indicating that the protein in the plant as well has a collection of amino acids that have value not only as um, uh, good for our biochemistry um, or metabolic, metabolic activity, um, but those amino acids are indicated for skin health as well. So again, what is the commercial value of breadfruit and are we exploring this? We know that on island, we have been producing breadfruit flour and that is highly commendable. I love to see it on the supermarket shelves. Uh, I like to know that it is being embraced, but are we embracing it fully? The breadfruit flower, um, with all of its nutrients and nutrition, um, could be used to produce breadfruit pasta. I'm not sure if this is a product that is already uh, being explored, but this is something we can look at. And we can also enhance the nutritive value by incorporating some of the other underutilized plants. And this is something that within our farmer's kitchen demonstration unit uh, that we are going to be examining. Um, baked goods within the farmer's kitchen. And I have to say that this is the innovation of Bernice Chase, who is director at the farm and her husband, Peter Chase. Um, they have been uh, innovative 
for years, winning many awards at the NIFCA culinary events. And uh, she has been demonstrating the value of breadfruit flour in the baking of specialty breads and also in our um, sweeter uh, baked goods like our um, Christmas cake, or we call it great cake, we call it black cake. Um, and um, she truly um, is very innovative and working with us closely as we work to demonstrate the full value of this resource. Um, it can also be used in thin slices, which I think persons probably do at home, but do we need to be bringing in all of those potato crisps, all the multitude of versions we see in the supermarket? Let us see some breadfruit crisps on the supermarket shelves. We can then also make breadfruit chips, which will be um, the more substantial version, and not the version that you munch on. But being a source of carbohydrate, we can also um, use that carbohydrate, take it through the process of fermentation, and we can get alcoholic beverages. And I want to share with you um, this product, which is that produced by Meadows in the Sun Wines. This is one of the companies that we work with because um, he embraces our natural biodiversity um, in the same way that JMP Farms and other persons are doing. Um, he has explored um, aloes, he has aloe wine, he has dog dumpling wine, he has bay leaf wine, um, he has a wine that is good for colds and flu based on ginger. And the roasted breadfruit wine is an amazing product because when you have a glass of that roasted breadfruit wine, you have to look carefully to make sure that you actually do not have roasted breadfruit in that glass. It has captured the aroma of roasted breadfruit in an amazing way. And it is a, a, a white wine and it's smooth on the palate and the flavor um, is very special. Um, so I'm using this as an example when I say that breadfruit is underutilized because we are not um, exploring the full potential of this fruit. We know that breadfruit has a big history uh, across the Caribbean. It was brought over by, sorry, it was brought over from the Pacific um, during the period of slavery on island as a food for our, our ancestors who refused it. Um, and I think that was a form of resistance, but subsequently it has become uh, very important because it was recognized as a great food source and we need to build on that. Where are we going to take breadfruit next? And my last one, Again, I know persons are going to say, but why are you saying that Barbados cherry is underutilized? I'm saying this because we all hear about the vitamin C content of the Barbados cherry, but we are giving it to me, not the, to me, not the attention that it requires. So let's look here. Um, this is a table comparing the nutritional value of our Barbados cherry with that of the other cherry that we see readily available in the supermarket at those quite exorbitant prices. Um, we have some vitamin A in our cherry relative to the recommended daily allowance at 15%. But look at that. Is that 2,796% of the recommended daily allowance within 100 grams of our Barbados cherry? We see that we hear about that. Everybody talks about the vitamin C content of our Barbados cherry, but are we exploring that? I say no. So what is the commercial value of vitamin C? So we just saw um, the richness of vitamin C in our Barbados cherry. And I went to a chemical company that packages uh, vitamin C, ascorbic acid, um, to look at the commercial value of vitamin C. And can we translate this into our Barbados cherry as a source? It says that um, vitamin C or ascorbic acid is used as a preservative 
to extend the shelf life and quality of baked goods. Of course, um, added to beverages to enhance nutritional value. So they package vitamin C for that purpose. Uh, the, in fruit processing, um, where your fruit is susceptible to aerial oxidation, um, vitamin C can delay that aerial oxidation, preventing your fruit during processing from um, having a change in appearance and impact on quality that reaches the consumer. The meat industry uses vitamin C similarly to maintain the fresh appearance of meat. It is used in water treatment because um, it is actually an antioxidant and it can decrease the levels of chlorine in treated water. Of course, it is offered in supplements and it is also important in the cosmetic industry because it is anti-aging and accumulates in the skin naturally as a form of protection. So when I ask the question, um, are we maximizing on the use of the Barbados cherry? Of course we're not. Um, here we have um, a product. I, of course, um, blocked out the actual brand, but the point here is that this is a dietary supplement. It says ascorbic acid with bioflavonoids. This is probably a formulation made within that chemical company, but that little fruit that sits on our tree has this formulation. What are we doing? We need to have groves of our Barbados cherry, just like we have um, wine, we have the, the, the grapes being grown and these lovely groves and we bring our visitors in um, to demonstrate, you know, the value of the grape, the grape production into wine and whatever else. We need to be thinking that way. What is special and unique about Barbados? And how do we make that more visible and authentic uh, within our tourism model? And I am claiming here that the Barbados cherry needs to be given more attention. Uh, I know how easy it is for external forces to take over uh, what is unique to a space. And I'm always very concerned about that. If we do not give attention to what is special and unique about Barbados, um, we leave ourselves vulnerable to persons coming in and say, well, I have decided that I'm going to use this plant for this purpose, and we have lost our opportunity. Um, so I'm not saying that other persons may not be using, and I'm about to end by showing you um, its commercial value. But what I'm saying is that when we look at the whole issue of growing our own, um, decreasing our import to build, uh, we need to be looking at, again, this value within our plant biodiversity and making sure that we are maximizing the potential of the biodiversity. So here we have, I think this is likely my last slide. Um, we know that um, Rihanna Robin Fenty um, was just given the National Order of Hero by our Prime Minister, but she's also an, a very astute businesswoman. And uh, she has recognized the commercial value of Barbados Cherry. Here we have a cosmetic product. It is a toner and uh, part of the active agent within this toner is the Barbados cherry. And I put forward, it is that level of ascorbic acid, which is anti-aging and good for the skin that is applied here. So my point is this, that we need to fully explore the potential of our plant biodiversity. Uh, we need to embrace our scientists. We need to understand um, that the time is now. Um, Barbados has a lot of intellectual capacity. Um, that really is our resource in addition to the plants around us. And we need to put the two together to work for our benefit. In closing, I know that I'm beyond the 10 minutes, but I don't think I'm too far beyond. Um, I am putting forward, again, the support for our local plant biodiversity as a valuable resource. Um, food and nutrition security must be a priority. 
And we saw the impact of the pandemic, how our people were wrapped around supermarkets for their food, and this must not happen again. We need all of you who are in attendance to take away from here the importance of exploring what is around us. Um, convert your lawns, please, to um, a food resource. We can do it, it's not difficult. If you think that you are unable to do that, we've got the resources. Uh, we heard um, John Hunt speaking from his point of expertise. And I know that within his organization, um, his people are focused on doing this and they're going to be very willing to share with the general public um, so that we all have our food garden. And if we are ever, I think it was put forward um, in the, the student dialogue, what happens when we are no longer able, even for a period of time, to get what we need into the island. Come on, we have to change our mindset. Um, I think that in a strategy going forward, we need to prioritize. We are not naive and thinking that we can embrace all of the um, biodiversity, but what is offering us versatility as I have demonstrated for the breadfruit, as I have demonstrated for the Barbados cherry, we need to prioritize uh, plants that can be shunted into agriculture, uh, into crop development. And we know that we can't just say that we're going to grow these plants without having um, an output. We need to be sure where we're shunting um, the plants that we're growing, and we need to have a multifaceted approach. What are the avenues for the plant material that we're going to be uh, experimenting with in these new crops? And this is where the research comes in. We cannot avoid that. We don't want to be second guessing. We need to be armed with um, the data sets. Um, so I'm suggesting here that our plants can be used in um, generating spice blends, teas, flowers, greens, agri-processed foods, um, we know the money involved in a pharmaceutical, and I do not think that we can go that route. Um, I also do not support these um, single entity um, products for mitigation. Um, I think that the plants are smart in terms of um, they will make a number of closely related compounds. Um, that work synergistically together. And I am in support, therefore, of the development of nutraceuticals as opposed to um, individual drugs or pharmaceuticals. Also, cosmeceuticals. We saw the toner product. It could be as simple as that. It could be more complex. Um, is the next anti-aging product going to come from Barbados? I think that that would drive our tourism numbers sky high um, because all of this activity must now be better linked um, to the tourism model. Um, it, it's not only about product, or rather it's about diversification of product. Um, we're talking about tangible product, but we're also talking about, um, as Dr. Clark, or Reverend Dr. Clark was so eloquent in sharing with us, it's about the spiritual component, um, walking through our cherry grove. What, what do you get from that? It's the essence of seeing the plants growing. Um, it's the essence that the cherry tree is very aromatic. What does that elicit in the person as they're walking through? And then we can take them to look at how um, we produce products with our cherries. Um, we can produce wines, beverages. We can produce these anti-aging products. Um, so for me, there is a massive potential here as we go forward and uh, add value to our local plant biodiversity. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Peter, for shining the light on the value and use of some of the everyday plants in our environment that we tend to ignore. We are running out of time, or we are rather out of time. So at this point, I would like to turn the meeting back over to Dr. Bino, who will do the closing. Good afternoon to everyone present. You know, closing for me, is pretty easy because we had an excellent symposium over the last two days. And before you go anywhere, Roxanne, um, I want to recognize yourself, Dr. Wave, for the excellent job that you have done in terms of facilitating and hosting 
um, us through these two days um, very eloquent, very succinct, and you really did a good job at, in terms of keeping us flowing. So thank you for that. I want to also take this opportunity to acknowledge our key partners. And, um, you know, it was amazing that the, the Minister of Health and Wellness took time out from his very busy schedule to address us. So to the Honourable Ian Gooding Edshill, I, I express my sincere gratitude for you joining us yesterday. Um, we had some very, very important strategic partners who spoke on behalf of their organization. So I'd like to recognize Professor Winston Moore of the University of West Indies campus, of course, the deputy principal and Professor Economics. Also, Alistair Glean, you know, he did an excellent job of putting the assets behind, you know, why is this important from a practical and even from a business perspective. And we appreciate that. Also, in terms of lending us um, Dr. Weif um, to be the host throughout this symposium, that's amazing. So we really value that partnership. And as usual, we will continue to build a pundit, a pundit. Now, we had some very key civil society partners who took center stage here. We had the um, Bicultural Educational Research Program, Youth Equipped to Achieve, and also Cardinal College. So I'd like to recognize um, Marsha Ann Clark of Ye, Dr. Sonia Peter of Burt, and also Reverend Dr. Clark of Cardinal College. Not only did they come in as strategic partners, but in terms of the quality of their presentations, you just only have to look at the youth dialogue we had this morning. The presentation we just had by Dr. Peter and earlier yesterday, I mean, amazing and great content. And when we looked at this, we wanted to have the environmental, we want to have the economic, but we also want to have society. Within society, the spiritual element, Reverend Clark did an excellent job of incorporating that spiritual element. And again, we thank you for that. Now, we can't talk about um, traditional medicine and pharmacopoeia unless we talk about Dr. Damien Pohol, who's been a stalwart within the Caribbean in this regard. And therefore, a special thank you to Dr. Pohol for his time, for his inspirational presentations, and also for his commitment to this field. And I can tell that this field is in good hands with Dr. Kohol. Beyond that, we had a, a very intriguing presentation, of Professor Sean Carrington. And you know, when he talks about plants, everything just comes alive. You, you, can, you can really understand the direct link and the importance that he places on, on these plants, but also he, he implored us to, to take it even more seriously than we currently do because they're here today and they've gone to more. Excellent presentation there. And we appreciate, we really appreciated that. Now, we took things home today um, in relation to the economics of things. And, um, you know, again, we had an excellent contribution by Dr. Pohol, also by John Hunt. John Hunt really deserves a special honor for his commitment to sustainable agriculture in Barbados and the region. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if soon the University of West Indies confers on him the honorary doctorate because he deserves it. Dr. John Hunt, thank you very much for that inspiring presentation as usual. And, you know, we can't have sustainability without our youth. And that's why Ravali, um, Shane, Jade, um, amazing. Not only in terms of your ability to take the information that you got from the experience with you, but your ability then to communicate it, to interact with it, to question it, and, and then to bring greater insight. That was in itself inspirational. We thank you for that. And we hope that you continue this journey in terms of building that relationship between plant biodiversity and traditional medicine. Um, now, we often see persons here on the, uh, the screen, but there are many people behind the scenes making it happen, the backbone, so as it would. And you know, we have two very important colleagues um, from the United Nations Development Program on the Jeff's Small Grants Program. And, and that is um, Karen Harper, who's the program assistant. And she has really kept things technically sound, not only in terms of this, but from an organizational perspective. So we really want to give her kudos for the excellent work that she has been doing and strongly supported by our current intern, um, Daniel. You know, Daniel is amazing and, you know, he is just so diverse in the way how he can manage different aspects of what he's called to do. And this symposium was one of his special responsibilities and he did not feel. Daniel, a special thank you to you. Um, 
holistically, we had an excellent symposium. And I know that our resident representative, Valerie Cliff, is very pleased with the work that we are doing. And we appreciate that UNDP has formally put this work within the, um, the plan, not only for Barbados, but within the OECS, and it's also within the, the multi-country framework at the larger UN level. So all that's left for me to say is thank you very much for taking your time to join us because we know your time is important. So we'd appreciate that you at least chose to spend it with us. But I'm also going to encourage you to go back, go on the Facebook um, stream that we have there, rewatch some of these presentations, look out for the um, feature by UETV. And of course, I must close by thanking UETV because their team led by Janet Carew has been amazing. So make sure you tune in. We're going to send you a blast when that is coming on um, via UETV. Tune in, learn, and enjoy. Because biodiversity conservation, plant biodiversity, and traditional medicine, yes, it was then, but it's also now. And how we deal with it now would determine the impact it would have in the future. Thank you, and God bless.